we're kidnapping Iraqi generals. Uh, we're acquiring. Uh, well, kidnapping. Well, body you know, snatching. Yeah, body snatching. Well, I, I would say <laughs> that we're, sounds we're, way better. We're, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're inviting Iraqi general to yeah. prison. How about that? I didn't see the ocean until I came to until I came to Bats. Well, actually, when I met Jacko first time, we were doing the quail swim uh, in the SEAL Team 2, and the Jacko just showed up. Fuck, that guy was towing <laughs> me, the other guy, and the buoy. We basically, well, instead of saying hijack, because this kind of sounds bad, I would say we You acquired. can say hijack. <laughs> Using my technique of the convincing the guy to speak, not very effective, so I say, I'm, I'm going to help you, Johnny, so uh, let me go use my Dragless Accelerated English course. He got a shot of morphine, he, so he shut up, he stopped screaming, and then, you know, we hauled his ass to prison. We cannot just dump them and say, well, you didn't retire, honorably retire, so fuck you, I'm not going to help you. We will help you. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Then in the prison I was sitting with Andrew Krasuski and like four other prisoners, and they were transporting us. This one had the Solidarity Trade Union flag. The, the armband came up, but I was told I was told not to do it. And <clears throat> so we arrived to the Herbish of prison. And uh, then was, was life was totally different now. So <clears throat> uh, there was sitting people from uh, uh, from engineers, professors, from uh, all kinds of workers' lives. The the old oppositions, people who opposed communism in nineteen. 60s, 70s, to, to very new leaders of solidarity, trade union. And they, uh, so for me, it was not really the, uh, uh, it was much, the prison was more inconvenience than punishment, but it was even more education. That's where I started, uh, started really learning a lot about Poland, history of Poland, uh, history of socialism, communism, and history of, uh, you know, the opposition in Poland, opposing communists. Wow. <coughs> so it's almost like a, <clears throat> like an underground re-education kind of... Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. 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 But, and I, I can only assume, or, or I guess I'm asking, it, um, was it a lot less violent? It was like you're all kind of on yeah. the same team? Oh, yeah. There was my... First, we're all on the same team. Well, even the criminals, you know, the, the, at the very beginning, so the first running that I had with the guy, when I knocked his uh, front teeth out for the necklace, that, um, that was just new. They were just beginning, pretty much, of the martial law, right? But later on, these people are started helping us. They said, okay, this, this is what you do in prison. This is how you do it in prison. This is how you get along. This is how you go about with the guards and all that stuff. So we learned, we didn't ac- adapt everything because we create our own regulations and regulamin. There was a regulamin by the prison uh, administration. We create our own. We didn't, we, we totally ignore the other one. We just follow up our own. So if one of us got beat, got, uh, got beat up, we had, we go on hunger strike. If somebody gets locked up in the isolation cell, we go on strike, we do this, we do, we do that. So they had a hard time. So I remember this funny thing because my mom came outside of schedule to prison one time to visit me. I was like, how did you make it happen? You know, there's no time for the visits. She said, well, she showed me the letter from the ward and say, say that they basically call her to come and calm me down. Because <laughs> they say that, 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 that I, have this, I have this, I'm going to post it on my website. It says that, uh, behavior of your son is highly negative and eta socialist. So um, uh, we just inform you so and so. And f- the phone call follow up that she can come and visit me and influence me. Yeah. So my mom actually showed me that, and uh, and and, and uh, she was crying, of course. But she said, "Do what you do. You're doing all right." Yeah. And uh, I found this by accident when my mom passed away. I was looking through her uh, some of the documents and I found that note. So wow. I brought it with me to the United States. Oh, that's awesome. I showed it to my wife. We were yeah. wow. laughing at it. That's crazy. Um, what were the living arrangements like? Was it like a normal in, prison? In Hrubyshev, there was there was normal prison. It was harsh, but we made it not harsh. Uh, but the food was way better. I, I, I t- well, I have to admit that the food that they fed us in that prison sometimes was better than I ate at home when we were poor. So I couldn't, compl- I can't complain about the food. 
the prison war on the one once we get rid of the 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 the, the, the hateful communists came a little bit different that uh, that was trying to actually be amicable to us and prison guards they were different uh, they up there most of them they were just farmers who were making extra money because everybody was poor in Poland so work in prison for a, a part time for a few hours here and there but they were just people like my uncle like my uh, you know other family members and uh, and they were trying not to harm us they were, they were they were i would say sometimes they were helpful to us with like when we demanded eventually when the, when the when the amnesty was coming so they already knew they would have to release us so they tried to be amicable even more so they were actually helping us how to obtain the how to get the so we can go to classes we have a, we could have a history classes polish history classies they were of course run by andrew krasuski and the kenjorski and uh, uh, jerzy kanievski or the, 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 everybody was doing its part i'm talking about those leaders uh, 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 Binkowski, uh, 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 Vitek Kashuba. Those are my heroes. Those are people who educate me not only to be uh, uh, op- uh, in opposition, effective, uh, effective, uh, 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 but also educate me on the other level too. You know how to be a good human being, yeah. and a lot of these things change. So, oh. yeah, yeah, those those are the, the real heroes. I describe them in the book. And my book actually says a lot about these people, and the, there's even entire uh, chapter dedicated to these people. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, so you spent a year and a half there. Yeah, yeah. And then what? What was the process for you getting out? Well, the John Paul II was coming to Poland second time, but he demanded that uh, political prisoners will be released. Uh, of course, socialists uh, they were very upset because, according to them, they were not. Poland did not have political prisoners. We were all criminals because they already really, by this time they start release those people arrested in the first wave. Those thousands of people arrested the first night, and they call them actually not prisoners. They call them internees. So they were in the internment. They were not internment camps. They were not criminals. They didn't call them criminals, uh, but same thing. They were sitting in prisons. Whether you call it internment ca- concentration camp or you call it uh, uh, prison, it's still the same thing. Yeah. With us, it was different because we broke the law. Uh, the, I broke the law because I published the information outside of the censorship. Law in social law in social socialist states is always uh, weaponized. It criminalizes every opposition, every means you can oppose the socialists. It will be criminalized. So we are common criminals. So uh, when John Paul II demanded that, that political prisoners will be released, he meant us, and there was big upset for the socialist uh, communi- for the communist and socialist state. But eventually they did. So they 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 enacted amnesty and were coming out. So my release was I was called in. <coughs> um, my clothes that it was winter time, but uh, when I was arrested, but then. When I was released, it was like late, uh, it was summer, early summer, I think, or late spring. They were, uh, they gave me my clothes and said, get the fuck out of here. Uh, they just gave me money so I can buy a ticket. So I have to walk like four or five miles to that little town, get the train ticket, and just at the, uh, ride the train back to my city. In my city, I didn't have enough money even to buy the ticket, so I was just kind of like riding without paying. Uh, yeah to home wow. uh, but <clears throat> yeah the funny thing is that I was you know I was working with my coat heavy coat my boots you no know, and, and my laces broke up uh, and uh, so people look at me like a bomb there was like oh another you know, criminal is c- criminal because in Poland at the time even the people who were poor they, everybody wanted to look nice you know so they always wear the best clothes they could like I had a I remember when I was Throughout my entire life in Poland, I had two sets of clothes. One was for the church. We call it the church clothes and the, the, the yeah. everyday clothes. But you never wanted to show up yourself on the street looking like a bomb. Everybody was trying to do its best. So people looking at me say, like, that motherfucker looks like a real bomb. He doesn't really <laughs> care. I, I, I care, but I just, didn't, I just was going home from prison. So. Yeah, wow. 
What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. So you make it back back to your hometown. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I call my mom. <clears throat> I let her know that I'm coming. I didn't want her to have a heart attack. So yeah, yeah so I came in. And I was like then the whole family came in to greet me, and it was like I, I remember early war. So that was pretty nice. Yeah. So what did you do from the t- from that day of of walking back? Into well, your home? I, tr- I tried to set my life back again. I tried to get a job and try to go into. Uh, find something of course i came back to my taekwondo club i start train start training there again and uh and the, but then it ha- it, ha- it happened it's not the first time it done to me in prison during the investigation they done to me twice they pull me out of the cell like two o'clock three o'clock in the morning they throw me in the civilian car they handcuff me throw me in civilian car and just drove me around the city outside the city to the woods to the fields and back to the prison so I was really scared at the time. I thought they, I would be one of those guys who disappeared. And they did it twice, so the th- but the third time they did when I was released from prison. So that was working, I remember the first time when they did, I was working with my Taekwondo buddies. Uh, and they, uh, the, 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 the Polish unmarked car, police about unmarked car pulled in. They jumped out and they just grabbed me by the hands. They handcuffed me, they threw me in the car. They showed the badges, of course, too. So, and say, so go with us. And they drove me again around the town, outside the town, in the fields, in the woods, and back, and just throw me out on the outskirts of the city. So, they've done it three times, I think. And, you know, like, they, it wouldn't bother me at day, day, daytime because I can take a, <coughs> take a bus and go home. But when they did it, like, at two o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the, in, at night, then, uh, that was kind of hard because the buses didn't work. So I think the last time I had to walk like six miles to get somewhere where I can catch some kind of bus and get closer to home and walk. So I got scared. I said, like, say, well, that's just a matter of time. And maybe one day I don't come back from these escapades and decide to ask for help. So all these memoirs for the back talking about the free America. I said, well, I might just as well try it. I really didn't even believe that somebody will listen, but I say, well, it's such a great country, maybe they will just see something in me, so maybe they will accept me. And uh, they did. You know, I went up there and there's a guy that like an emergency, I would say emergency visa, because very quickly um, I got the promise not, promise not is that, yes, I will be allowed to settle in America. <clears throat> so for me to uh, now, to, I need to obst- obtain Polish passport. They were pretty eager to give you those passports, but you still have to go do the whole document checks. Like I had to go to military and and get a stamp that I'm not being sold uh, by the military, that they don't need me. So this, this, this the, the story with this eagle came out. And I woke up there to get a, <clears throat> a stamp. I sh- uh, the, that motherfucker sitting behind the Polish uniform, the communist Polish uniform, uh, start yelling at me that yeah I'm supposed to be serving I should be serving under this Polish eagle and he just, just like shows on that eagle over his desk and, and not just go and, and just uh, go somewhere or to the west so I very quickly reminded him that first it's not the Polish eagle because it's missing a crown the crown the Bolsheviks stole it actually they they kidnapped the entire eagle and sent him to Siberia the, the Bolsheviks like you but I wouldn't be in your. I would, I would not want to be in your shoes when this eagle comes back and kick your fucking ass. Yeah. And then, uh, and, and, and no, no, the eagle came back, kicked this, the, such motherfuckers' asses. But the, I remember when I was leaving, I was walking on the main street in Lodz. I could hear this motherfucking squeaking and screaming and and, and squealing up there and yeah. stomping his floor. Like, yeah. How 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 motherfucker I am! <laughs> how yeah. bad I am! I was, yeah. like, I was thinking like, fuck you. Yeah. Uh, so you get the stamp from him. Did, where, yeah. where did you obtain the the emergency visa from an embassy? From, from the embassy. Yeah, yeah. There okay. was a like a, a promissory notice. That I, because you couldn't get a passport, nobody in Poland had a passport. So to get a passport, you have to have actually like a promissory 
uh, notice from the uh, U.S. government that okay. you are allowed to settle down, that you will receive the the, the refugee visa to America. That's I'm political refugee. My status was political refugee when I came to America. Oh, okay. So they uh, they sent me. Uh, then I, once I got that, I could just go uh, apply for passport, and that was given to me very quickly. And they, yeah, they left Poland. And uh, what was the the trip? process like like did, did uh, a, a u.s plane pick you up or, or no how? no so they i was given the ticket to germany and i had to fly to germany there were already people from the united states waiting for me they uh they placed us in the centers there were no camps they were just centers for political refugee from uh communist countries from actually not from communist countries from the solidarity trade movement trade movement they were treating us a little bit differently, so um, so I spent there. You couldn't come, you could not come to America at the time without having uh, somebody like sponsor or somebody taking care of you. Yeah. So you had to wait for somebody to volunteer, and I didn't have to wait long. But so after a short time, uh, I was calling the office up there. In the meantime, they were preparing us to live in America. So they were telling about America about how people live, you know, what to do, what not to do, you know. What I, year was this? That was 1984. Okay. <clears throat> so nobody, but you know, nobody ever asked me like, what can you do for America? They just asked me one thing. So we ask you to respect our citizens and our laws. So. And, that, and yep. you're like, yeah, I'll do that. Hey, yeah. You know, hell yeah. yeah. This, <laughs> uh, this is what I uh, promised myself, you know, that, yeah. uh, that I will be the best American America can have. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so you're in Germany. Where did you land first? Uh, in Frankfurt, I think Frankfurt. They they send us to city, uh, but so then I think uh, I don't remember the name of it. A small German town, and I had like twenty dollars, and I remember that I always wanted to have a little tape recorder. <laughs> so I said like, fuck, now I can go in Germany, I can buy it. In Poland, even if we had the money, you couldn't buy it because it was not there. So I went up there and bought me tape recorder, I spent all the money. And then so I was calling the office, say, hey, where would you like to settle? Do you have any, uh, uh, like the- uh, Preference. Preference. So I say, yeah, somewhere is hot. I say, I'm so fucking co- tired being cold. So somewhere is hot. I say, how about Memphis, Tennessee? I say, is it hot up there? I say, oh yeah, it is hot. I say, well, what do you know anything about Memphis? I say, no, I know Elvis Presley and Memphis are connected, but but nothing else. But as long as it's hot, I'm fine with it. So they send me there, and wow. I, uh, I, I I arrived in America. So people already was waiting for me, and uh, everything was pretty much taken care of. You know, it's like for the first few weeks or a couple of weeks, I was living with older uh, couple, elderly couple from the church in their uh, little home. And uh, so, you know, there was, I didn't speak English, so they bought me even the dictionary, like in Polish, English, English, Polish. I still have this dictionary for, for, the, for a reason, because on one of the trips, you know, I, when they bought me the dictionary, I wanted to impress them because I didn't speak English. So I wanted to learn, I wanted to show them, you know, the, the gratitude that I'm using it and uh, I'm trying to learn English. So we drive on the street and they, they just show me around the Memphis. And so I see the trees, like, this is a tree. It's like, <laughs> yeah, good, you know, this is a house. <laughs> so we're going up there until we run to the black man walking on the street. So I'm just like, this is mm, the, the word. And, and the, I knew something wrong. The guy almost lost control of his car. The lady, does, does like, I'm talking about like 70 years old people. The lady freaked out and just looked at me with the, with the f- like fear, terror in her eyes. Like, no, 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 no. It's like, well, you gave me the dictionary. I just like showing to them the dictionary they gave me. There's like a translation, you know, from a black person to English was N word. That, that, that was in the dictionary? Yeah. No shit. Well, I have this dictionary today too, wow. so I'm, I'm going to pause online this. So what she did, she very quickly scratched off that word and wrote black man. You can see it, I have it, yeah. what, 40 years later, I still have it. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it is wild, but uh, you know, like I didn't know any better, I didn't know yeah. English. There was a like, culture shock was huge. Was, yeah, I, was, <laughs> I wanted to ask like, what was your first impression of America from what you thought it would be to what it actually was? 
No, it was better than I thought it would be. It was compassionate. Not only people were free and and living their lives the way they wanted to live, but they were compassionate. That this is what um, I remember America. I think the most the compassion. So yeah. that's something that is, is stuck with me for I think for the rest of my life. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like they they were coming to my place and asking me if I need anything. There were people I they didn't know me from Adam, but they were just. Hey, do you have everything? Do you have a food? Because you know, first at the beginning, I eventually I got a job. I was a janitor, so uh, I didn't make a lot of money. So they were this is where they were, but they gave me my own apartment, where I didn't know at the time. But the only thing I could afford was apartment working as a janitor in project. But dude, that was like a in heaven. I couldn't when they walked me into that apartment. I couldn't wait for them to leave so I can call my mom and say, "Mom, I'm living in a real apartment." Yeah. You know, apartment has a little bit different meaning in Poland at, that, at least at that time had than it is now. So I was like, in my apartment, so my mom in a panic. Can you afford it? This apartment? I say, yeah, I can afford it, and I can even have. I have even climatization. I have air conditioning, and I have a fridge. So she couldn't believe. She's like, no way. How, how much does it cost? I said, well, it costs enough that I can afford as a janitor. Yeah. So she she was very, very excited about that too. But also I had to uh, straight think a few things up. Because when I was watching movie with my mom, <clears throat> well, in Poland there's a custom. Poland was always cold, right? So you had a milk, you had a, like perishable things. To make it last longer, you put outside the window on the ledge. Sometimes it fell off. So... If somebody walked below, it could be dangerous. But this is how we did. So I remember watching these movies, American movies sometimes. They, I see these big boxes in the windows. I say, how Americans are awesome ideas. Why don't we have these boxes in the window? We can put more stuff outside. <laughs> well, I didn't know there were air conditionings. I thought they were just boxes so keep Americans yeah. keep the food in it. <laughs> But yeah, this, this guy, so I said, Mom, we use these boxes in the movie. We see, we think that it was yeah. the, the, that they are not boxes for food. They yeah. just cool your house, entire yeah. house down. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. But yeah, that compassion, this, this is something yeah. that uh, is, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. I always will be grateful for it. That's incredible. <laughs> um, how long did, did you stay there and were you a janitor? Like, walk us through from that point until you, you end up joining the military. How, how did that happen? So I was a janitor first, and uh, I was working hard, so I, I'm making my progression slowly more and more and more to uh, I start learning English too. So, and, and here coming, of, I might a little bit, uh, I need to add a couple of things here with the English. It was very difficult for me, and especially like word like TH, TH, like thank you, I couldn't say it for, for nothing. So one of these Polish guys say, look, I'm just, I, I'm cheating on it. I just don't say thank you. I say, thank you. Use F instead of TH. I say, cool. Yeah, the word's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> and until, until, you know, this one, one of the churches, they, they, they wanted to introduce me to their parishioners. So they invite me to the church after mass. The, the, the priest, the, the, the pastor, she came out with a big plate of cookies and I took the cookie and this uh, try to say the thank you and this guy <laughs> kind of like so like fuck you <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't go well. I already yeah. knew I say something wrong. I see the gasps and I'm just like what the fuck did I say just yeah. now? <laughs> and then just like older gentleman comes up say what he is trying to say is thank you and yeah. I was like thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I say that. So. So yeah, yeah so this this is, this is uh, that's uh, that's that was my start with English. Then again, culture shock. I was learning more about English. I was getting better jobs now, and uh, but still, at the church time, I was invited. I remember to a pool party, like the parishioners' uh, pool party, where there's like one of these wealthier parishioners from the church had a nice big pool. So the families came in with the kids with th with things, and I was invited to it too. So I think a pool party, so I want to present myself the best I can. In Poland at the time, you were the tightest speedos you can find. <laughs> and so we call, it, we call it banana hammock, right? So I'm just like the skippiest, the smallest one. So I look good. And so, you know, just woke up as all the kids are playing the pool. So I drop my trousers and I was just like, 
got quiet, <laughs> music stopped playing, <laughs> and I see the kids are being ushered out of the pool <laughs> somewhere <laughs> else. They took me to the other side of the house and they, they show me like big, yeah. big shorts. Yeah. Like basketball so, shorts. Yeah, basketball shorts. Uh, hey, can you wear these? I was like, yeah, sh- I didn't like it, but yeah. you know, beggars are not choosers. So I yeah. said, yeah, okay. And, and it, you know, in Poland, only those big ba- trousers you wore with, when you were fat or you were old. Yeah. So like, like a, you like disgrace, but I didn't care. Yeah. I seen the reactions. I knew yeah. something was wrong. I wore that. Yeah. But so I was, I was learning it. And then I got the job as a parts man. As a what? Parts helper. Oh, okay. In the dealership. Yeah. So my job was. Uh, Receive the answer the phone. The guy they already knew this guy who doesn't speak English very well. Yeah. It's worse that. <laughs> so they were with the number. So I, I got the uh, hello. This is Thomas. Okay, five five two three D F six six nine. It's like what the fuck was that? I was just writing it down. But you know, I made mistakes quite often. So. The, my job was to go get that number, pull the part out of the shelf, bring it to the um, to the counter, so whoever ordered the part can pick it up and take it with them. Most of the time, there were different dealerships, and oh god, I mean, I could hear you, motherfucker, you gave me <laughs> wrong part, you gave me wrong part. So yeah. they didn't know what to do with me, but I was working so hard they didn't want to outright fire me. So they say, hey, you are from Europe, do you know anything about European cars? I just, I was thinking like, they need a mechanic up there. Do you know anything about mechanics? I was like, hell yeah, I want to be a mechanic. Yeah, I do. I have no <laughs> fucking idea. I, I didn't I didn't even know anybody who had a car. My father had a car, but he took off. So all my friends, nobody had a car. I didn't even have a car. But I said, yeah, yeah, European cars, yes. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's how I got them the next step. The next stage was, uh, so that's another. Was fucking people's cars up? Yeah, well, no, the the guy who who actually took me under his wings didn't let me fuck these cars yeah. up. He was so he was like a motorcycle gangster. That's uh, um, his name was James Moore. I lost contact with him, but I owe him so much. So um, we they they took me to for the interview. There was a dealership selling Porsche, Audi, and Saabs. So Porsche guy came in, it's like, I can't understand this guy. So I need somebody this precise car. So I need somebody who speaks better English. And same with Audi. So waiting for the sub guy. And uh, I, I just see this. I didn't understand very well English at the time. But I was like, no, no. I said, I lost hope. And this, you can see this Harley, big Harley Davidson. Boom, rolls into the shop. The big guy. I was like, looking fucking Sasquatch. <laughs> this guy is like a Yeti. He, <laughs> so huge. And then he walks in, it's like, like is that the guy who 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 uh, wants to be a mechanic? Uh, the, the manager said, yeah, this is him. He said, so, said, do you want to work on Saab? I was like, yeah. I said, okay. He said, look at the manager. I need a slave. I take him. And uh, and he told me everything about the cars. Uh, I, 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 I should know. So, um, and we became like really good friends. I even coerced him. I, I promise him I will never tell it, but I think now it's 40 years later, I think I can. I promise him I will never tell the story because I, 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 my English was so poor. So I say, Jim, if you help me, maybe you read, I will record you. So then I can listen to you and I can, uh, I, I can listen to you and, uh, and I can get my English better. And I can understand this manual. I want him to read the manuals. So uh, I thought he would kill me. <laughs> I was like, hey, you fucking, I was making fun of me. I say, no. Uh, well, I didn't know that he didn't read very well. Uh-huh. So, so he, 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 maybe he was embarrassed or something, but he didn't want to do it. But he said, finally, I said, I talk him into it. He said, okay, but if you tell him about that, I'll fuck you up. I'll fucking yeah. kill you. And uh, and we were <laughs> sitting at his kitchen table with the big steaks. The steaks is another story I describe in the book. So, and he's reading, and sometimes he had to read two, three times the sentence because he's not reading that, he's not really proficient in reading. He's more motorcycle gangster than and mechanic than, than book reader. But he was like my dad almost reading me a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I recorded it. I still have these recordings. Oh, wow. And, and, uh, and uh, I would, when he was reading it, I was reading the manual, and actually that improved me much better understanding of manuals and cars. This is how I became a good mechanic. Yeah. So the guy, the guy, I owe, I owe Jimbo, I call him Jimbo, everybody, Jimbo so much. He's, yeah. uh, I don't know what he's now, but if he hears it, um, uh, cheers, brother. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate everything you did. 
That's amazing. There's a lot going on around the globe right now, and times can feel uncertain. We're working hard, and our dollars don't go as far as they used to. Many Americans are putting their expenses on credit cards, seeing their debt pile up. We can't trust our leadership for any sort of help, but one thing's for certain. My friends at American Financing have been helping homeowners like you. While it might feel overwhelming on your own, they can help you to use your home's equity to pay off that mounting debt. A 10-minute call is all it takes. These guys are in it for you and not the banks. Their customers are saving, on average, $700 a month. There's no cost or obligation to find out how much you can save. And in these uncertain times, savings needs to be a priority. Call their salary-based mortgage consultants today at American Financing. That's 866-890-9313. That's 866-890-9313. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times I can't turn my mind off at night, uh, and it's a little tough to get to sleep. Uh, Poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, lower productivity, Uh, And really, that's sleeping less than six or seven hours a night. And that could be reduced white blood cell count. Uh, You know, the white blood cell count is is really what protects your body against illness, disease, fighting viruses, bacteria, etc. It's no secret that sleep is really the foundation for our mental and physical health. It's, uh, you know, performance driven. I mean, it, it has a an overreaching impact in every aspect of our life. And it's crucial that you get good, quality, restorative rest. That's why I like Beam Dream. Um, today, my special listeners uh, get a, a discount on Beam Dream Powder. It's their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. It's also available in uh, pretty awesome flavors such as cinnamon cocoa, chocolate peanut butter, and mint chip. Um, it's a great product. Uh, helps turn your mind off. There's no uh, gnarly side effects. It doesn't make you feel groggy the next day. Uh, it contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, um, epigenin, and melatonin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. I just like to mix it into a little hot water or milk, stir, froth it, and enjoy it before bedtime. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, take advantage of the biggest sale of the year and get up to 50% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash mic drop, all caps, all one word. Discount auto applied at checkout. Uh, the no code is necessary. And that's beam, B E A M dot com slash mic drop for up to 50% off. Uh, how long were you, did you work there? I worked there uh, until the war broke out. So that's. So for a while. Uh, yeah, 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 I worked there for a while. So then, well, I switched later to a Mercedes dealership. But what happened is the first war broke out. And I guess before you get into that, was that in Memphis too? Yeah, that was Memphis, yeah. yeah. So, you, so when the war broke out, I became the U.S. citizen at the same time. And uh, I, was, I was, by this time, I, my life was great. I mean, I was making good money. I was skydiving. I was making <laughs> extra money teaching skydiving. So, yeah, that was, life was great. And the war broke out. So I was just thinking like, look, uh, everything I have, everything I own, I owe to America. American people, so I go fight for them. This and is 9 11? Yeah. No, 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 no. This is the first Persian war. Okay. So I said, there is war going on. I'll go fight the war. And then I come back to my life. I just go, I never intend to go for for, for, for career. I just thought that America is fighting war. This is the best way I can support my country and uh, my fellow citizens. So I, I volunteered to, to join the Navy. And uh, that was you, my moral obligation to yeah. do so. No, I love it. Um, did you have uh, any idea about the SEAL teams at that point? Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, my idea was not even to join the SEALs. I just wanted to go fight in the war, wherever the America needs me. But at the same time, it happened that I met Navy SEALs because I was teaching skydiving. So on the weekend, we were always skydiving. Sometimes I was making five, six, maybe eight jumps a day. So when they came in do demonstration or jump in Memphis, Ten- Memphis, Tennessee, they came to our drop zone also to jump for fun. Yeah. And uh, this is how I met them. And they said, by this time I was pretty much done with the process of joining, but joining army. Because I didn't see that, I didn't know about the distinctions between army, navy, marines, uh, coast guard and air force. For me it was almost army. So I went, to, it was big written thing, army, so I went, went up there. Well, first I tried to join, but just, I went to the post office 
after the world broke up and I feel the paperwork, I thought this is like the, I was naive, that this is the how you do that, uh, how do you join the military. But it was the, what do you call it, that the draft card for the- S- uh, Selective service. Selective service card, yeah. yeah. So uh, I filled <clears> it up, I sent it off, I went to my apartment, but I was leaving for other skydivers, started packing myself. I was like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to war. Well, you're crazy, how do you go to war? I mean, well, why did you go to war? I said, well, America's fighting war. I'm American, I go fighting the war. So, so you didn't tell us anything about joining it. I said, well, I'm jo- I just joined it like, what, well, yeah, this morning when I filled this paperwork, what paperwork? So they were kind of laughing, but 30 days later, the note came in that, um, thank you, but no thank you, this is for young Americans, yeah. you too old. I'm, yeah, because you're 29, 30? Well, 32. Oh, 32, okay. So 31, actually, 31 at the yeah. time. So the, the 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 process took. So I went to army office. They told me go to army. So I went to army and uh, we did that. And then we came back to. Uh, uh, so that's what I meant. The Navy SEALs. And they told me to change that. Go to maybe I want to be a Navy SEAL or something like this. So I went to the Navy recruiting office and say, Hey, you know what about Navy SEALs? And I want like, Ooh, Navy SEALs. What you <laughs> that? I say, Well, I jump with them. And say I would like to. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm joining army, but is there any chance I can join the navy now? So yeah, go grab the papers. Yeah. So I was very awkward for me because I made friends with these guys yeah. with the army. But I went up there, grabbed the paperwork, I brought them to navy office, and uh, and then that was pretty much done. Uh, then the army finished everything, so I was about to join. So they 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 tell me like I'm kind of old, so they cannot. They, at that time it was a diaper program, yeah. F by F, we can join the seals, we have a guarantee going to seal selection course the, in the bats. But um, I was too old for it. To say, well, don't worry about it. You are thirty, going thirty two now, but I'll be fine because once you go to boot camp, they make a seal out of you. So yeah. you're, okay, well, again, I didn't despair. I didn't care because the, my intention was fight war for America and not just be a SEAL or, or yeah. something else. So they, I didn't really care where they sent me. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I went to boot camp and uh, then joined the, uh, passed the test. It was kind of a funny story with it, but I, I described in the book and joined the SEAL. Eventually I, I was allowed, I was I got the age waiver and and uh, joined the uh, selection I was yeah. sent got the orders to selection but from military I was when I graduated from boot camp I graduated graduated as a number one recruit from all the graduating batch of uh, uh, students uh, the recruits so I was the number one top recruit uh, later in the, when I after that when I went to a school to be parachute rigger PR um, I also graduated in the top of my class or one of the guys in the top of my class so I think maybe the uh, command seen some uh, hope for me, yeah. Uh, and I got a waiver for my age, and I was got orders to bats. Yeah. Before we get into your SEAL career, um, what was the, just kind of real quick? What was the the thought process, or how did you get into fucking skydiving, living in Memphis as a fucking mechanic? <laughs> oh, with the with the skydiving. So I got the I met the gal. And that she it's was, always a chick. <laughs> so I met this chick, right? Yeah, met the and, chick. Uh, next thing you know, I'm she jumping was, out of a fucking from, airplane. Yeah, she, <laughs> she was from Missouri, and she had a daughter. But we started talking about. I think we even kissed, and uh, <laughs> uh, there was an, on, on the on our second date because I met her. She was there for a while, but then she had to leave. So we promised ourselves we go right to each other. We're gonna go and stay in touch, and um, she gave me her phone number. And her, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, her phone number. And uh, but she made the jump. She made. She was skydiving, mm. or, or maybe at least maybe she made like four or five jumps. So I say I cannot be less than the chick. <laughs> if you chick can jump, chick I can. Yeah, a yeah, you don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can do it too. Yeah. But uh, what happened is I, I lost this piece of paper. I lost contact with this girl. She was in Memphis in those 1980. I think five or six or seven if she hears that yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, so anyway so she was uh, uh, um, I lost that, that 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 point of contact we kind of lost contact we never I never heard from her again never seen her uh, well if she wanted she asked she had a my phone number so she yeah. could call she never called 
So, uh, so, but after that, that, that kind of put the bug in my head. If the chick can jump, why well, cannot jump? I think it might be something exciting. Yeah. So I found the telephone, the yellow pages that was before the computer times. Found this skydiving drop zone, uh, West uh, Memphis skydiving. So I called them, say I want to make a jump. Can I do it? Say yeah, come on over. It actually happened. There was a boogie happening at the time. So there was a bunch of skydivers from different drop zones were coming, and this whole weekend was jump going on all the time. So I went up there and I said, okay, so I'm ready to jump. I'm the guy who called. As they say, okay, so you cannot jump on your own. You have to jump tandem first. I say, okay, what is tandem? So we're tandem. We just strap you uh, to instructor. You just go for a ride. I say, well, kind of weird. Have a dude strap behind. <laughs> but I say, okay, so I do it. And so we did the first jump and I was hooked. I, I remember I was just like, okay, uh, can I do one more? Say, okay, do one more. Uh, so we did one more. I say, fuck, how do I do it on my own now? I want to do it on my own. They say, well, you have to go to the course. So we may maybe one week, you make two, three jumps, next week, two, three jumps, and then final jump maybe third week, and you'll be good to go. Seven jumps is AFF, accelerated free fall. So we, we, we just, you start jumping on your own. I say, okay, uh, how much does it cost? And so I'm buying it. So we started on Thursday. Friday and Saturday, I was jumping on my own. So, wow. <laughs> just uh, two days. <laughs> the accelerated, uh, accelerated. Yeah, that was really accelerated. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's wild. Uh, American women, like, what was your impression of them uh, when you first got here and, and starting to date and whatever? Did was it? Did it blow your mind? Did you like them? Did you think they were weird? What was your take on them? Uh, beautiful, but you know, I have to be careful here. I have a wife, yeah. and uh, uh, being a domesticated husband, I have to be very <laughs> careful how I wore these things. Uh, she, she, you know, she's she's working on her PhD right now, so yeah. she's very smart. She will understand. But my impression that uh, in general, the American women were bigger than in Europe. In Europe, maybe because the food was not right, there was uh, people were hungry. So all the chicks were very, very slim. So here I started li- liking the uh, like normal size, yeah. not, the, not the skinny ones. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, but otherwise they were like very outgoing. Like in, in Poland, there was still type of like, hey, you know, before I talk to you, I'm, I'm, I need like a very formal, it was much more formal. Oh, here you. it was like the free society, you know, yeah. say, hey, you know, how are you? Uh, this is like my friend uh, uh, who came to visit me. He was he went for running. And people waved to him, say, "Hey, how are you?" You know. Yeah. So for me, it was like just wow, this is so awesome. And uh, they are very open. They yeah. uh, if they like you, they they let you know that they like you. If they yeah. don't like you, they let you know they don't yeah. like you. Yeah, straightforward. It's, yeah, very straightforward. And yeah. uh, I really like the in Poland is now this pretty much the same thing. Yeah. When I went up there, you have the the girls are acting very similar, and um, they are still very slim. Yeah. But uh, but otherwise, is uh, the, the the reactions are the same. Yeah. And, uh, but for me, I was fascinated. All right, so we uh, we've covered the American women uh, <laughs> approach. Um, you go go through going back to you go through boot camp number one. There you go through parachute. But I, 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 I have to I have to jump something very quick here, uh, Mike, because when we talk about the women, I. I I don't want to be fired from being domesticated husband. So I need to say that the most beautiful girl I ever met <laughs> is my wife, yeah. Rachel, and uh, I love her with all my heart. So if you listen to this, Rachel, <laughs> I love you. You are my only mine. Cutie patootie. <laughs> okay, a, now we can move on. Uh, no, I, pr- I appreciate the... Uh, I guess the message, the note, that uh, it's for sure sweet. Um, <clears throat> so you go through boot camp, you pass the SEAL test. Um, had you swum much? Uh, no, I, 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 I never seen the ocean <clears throat> in my life. I didn't see the ocean until I came to to uh, the Pacific, until I came to Bats. Yeah. And I remember even the first, you know, the get wet and sandy, the first thing the always instructors tell you, go dip yourself in the ocean and... And then roll yourself in the sand. So I look at these guys because I'm new, right? So they they would be there longer. So we all ran the, the, the entire class, and they um, they just plop into like ankle deep water and just roll themselves in the water. And then in the sand, I say, "Fuck, that's too cold. I'm not going to do it. I just wait for this big wave to come in, just crash over me." 
uh, it was a big rolling thing. So I just, and then I get wet, I won't be suffering from being like half wet, half not. Oh God, I have no, I had no idea <laughs> what the, the power of the ocean is. I thought I would drown. I thought yeah. it rips my hands and the legs of me. I would just keep rolling, rolling, and I couldn't get up. Finally, at now, it's, and then I understood why they, they don't yeah. go any deeper. They just got the shallow yeah. water. Then I roll, uh, 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 spit all the water that I swallow, roll myself in the sand around the back. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so, I mean, passing, even passing the SEAL test, I mean, not being. <laughs> very well versed in swimming was that a challenge no not really that much it was uh, somewhat but you know by this time we already pre prepared myself a little bit i didn't oh, know okay. how to swim so when i went to a school <coughs> i met uh, jason cabell i know i can use uh, yeah. i can mention his name because uh, you know he's he's my brother we yeah. we went to war together but uh, so he didn't swim either and when i look at him i was thinking like this guy is sure he's going to graduate from bats but he swims worse than I do. So if he thinks that he will pass, definitely I will make it. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, so we kind of tried to help each other, but still didn't do well, yeah. they, they, they didn't know much about that. So this is what, 92? 1992, yeah. So you go to Bud's class, what? 185. 185. Uh, did you make it straight through? Uh, no, I didn't make it straight through. I made, right before the boot camp, I got the MRSA, the mm. infection. Yeah. My legs swole. And I remember I got into like into with the instructor into that stuff because they I went I, I I was waiting with this MRSA until Friday. I figure out that on Friday after the you know day is over, I would just run run up to Balboa to hospital, make them fix fix me, and then I will have a two days to recover. And I'll be good to go on Monday. So I ran up on Friday. They just open it up. They cut some of the shit out, and the, they just put the bandaid on it and send me home. And I say, okay, I'm good. But like Saturday, getting not better. Sunday, my legs swore, I couldn't put my pants. So Monday morning, I'm kind of in despair. I had to actually cut my pants to put my, because my leg was swollen, my, my tie was swollen so much. This is in boot camp or in buds? No, in buds. Okay. Oh, are you talking about the boot camp? No, no. no. I, I thought you said boot camp, but this is buds. No, buds, yeah, okay. buds. So there was class 185. And then, uh, we uh, so I, I had no choice. I had to go to tell them that I'm something's wrong with me. And where were you in training at this point? Uh, I think like a week before the hell week. We, okay. we were just right, right, going the mud flats. Okay. <clears throat> so they 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 put me on the table. They they said like I remember them cussing because they Balboa didn't irrigate it. Basically, what they what what I was told they supposed to take their little like a straw on like a plastic straw stick it into my hole, the, the, into my wound on my leg, and irrigate it with like something, like mm -hmm. antibiotic or whatever it is. They didn't, they just cleaned it up, they cut it out and put the bandage on it. So I was laying on this table for like another, maybe three hours, when they were just dripping on the inside that uh, wound uh, with this little straw st stuck inside. And that worked, my leg, uh, like next day, they sent me home. Next day they, uh, I went up there and but uh, find out that I'm being rolled from the class. I was like, "Why would you do that? I'm fine." He said, "No, you're not." So uh, I said, "No, I'm perfectly fine." Instructor says, "So I, I can I can show you." Okay, if you run the mile here or just uh, very quick and uh, on this time, we'll, we'll see. And I did. I, I did run, but then he said, "Like, I'm sorry, I can't. We can do it. Uh, we're going the mud flats, uh, flats, and mud flats, and you're gonna get all messed up." Yeah. And you need to, you just need to be rolled. Uh, I was heartbroken, but yeah, what what else yeah. could I do? Yeah. So I started with one eighty, started one eighty four, and I got rolled to one eighty five and one eighty five from the very beginning to the end. I, f I finished. Yeah. So I've I've had you know a number of seals on here. We won't belabor the the buds experience, but I am curious from growing up the way that you did, and in all the different things that you went through was. Was Buds as challenging as it's made out to be uh, for you? Uh, definitely was challenging, but maybe not the mental part, the physical part, because I was way older. I was like 10, 12, for 13 years older than some of the guys. Yeah. So my body, it took toll on my body. But uh, from another side, I was watching uh, some of the guys getting fr frustrated with being yelled at or being screamed or, or being, being getting scared of it. It's like... For me, 
I always assume this is a game. Yeah. So it like, didn't bother me at all. That's, you, you could yell at me all day long. I just do what you tell me to do, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to yeah. back down. Yeah. So yeah, that was, not, that, that, that was easier part for me maybe than on the young kids. But yeah. for the physical part, I just still, I couldn't comprehend after the day of beat down that we got, you know how it is. The guys were still getting out. I would say, okay, let's go uh, hunt some chicks. Let's go, <laughs> let's go get some chicks. Let's go to the bar. I was like, dude, uh, I can't. Uh, I mean, I, w- I was mad at the time, so yeah. I was not going. But um, but sometimes I went out with the guys. But but uh, I, I, I was paying Piper the next day because yeah. uh, I didn't have <laughs> enough rest. So yeah, it kicked my, kicked my ass yeah. physically, definitely, yeah. yes. I, I can't. I can't imagine going through at that age. I mean, I went at eighteen, right after high school, and uh, I mean, yeah, I checked in the SEAL teams as a new guy when I was thirty-three, going thirty-four. Wow. So that was. I, I think that there's not. There's very few guys who ever made. Yeah, to, very few uh, SEAL yeah. training at that age. Yeah, so I'm kind of unique. <laughs> yeah, well, you're more than unique. You're you're unique for more than just that. But uh, so you went to SEAL Team Two first. Yeah, I went to yeah. SEAL Team Two first, and. Uh, you know, when they tell you, when you're checking the command, you take your best uniform. And, uh, so I press, I spend all night pressing it, making sure my boots are shine, shoes are shine, and my dress blue, everything is squared away. I was just like nitpicking, even the little thread sticking out, I was burning with the matches and yeah. stuff, make sure that nothing is out of, of, out of order. So when I showed up, uh, <clears throat> the... The the you know the the formality first you mean the master chief, XO, CO and uh, and then you just, they send you on your way you go up there and start doing the you have the list and you just go by the list. So uh, my next thing would go to the uh, magazine to the uh, depot up there to get my gear, and I was intercepted by the older guys. Yeah. So here my ordeal started. Uh, then I started. I was explained that. The, uh, the guy like I am, so it's not, yeah, I'm not the seal. Oh, I was not the seal. That was a different procedure, right? So, uh, but you are just a fucking new guy, FNG. So you are FNG or meat. If somebody calls you FNG or meat, you respond. Yeah. <laughs> and now you meet, get on the pull-up bar, and watch the pull-up <laughs> as many as I can. So I'm in my dress, blues, and everything. I'm sweating. It's like, uh, it's warm weather. Okay, now sit up. So I'm in my dress blue. I'm sitting on the concrete on the on the asphalt up there, doing sit ups, then push ups, then uh, uh, you know all that's full piece. Then they they usher me so the command doesn't see it. Usher me to the back gate, the place <laughs> when we run the three mile, and then okay, it's three miles. So now you can imagine I'm just trying. To, you still have a hat on. I'm yeah. just trying to hold on to my hat in my nicely polished shoes, my uniform that is already fucked up, yeah. <laughs> and running three miles up there to the, <laughs> so the, the, that course that we always run for the uh, PPS, the, the, the test. And I did it, I made it, so they left me alone. But there was a welcome to the teams that I yeah. got. And yeah. I'm not the only one. Yeah. There was a, a standard at the time. Yeah. But you need to mention that, being that uh, becoming a SEAL was a little bit different. Today, you go to BATS for the selection, then you, you make it, you go to SQT. Yeah. And in SQT, you get, after SQT, you get your trident, and you are a SEAL. Yeah. That was different at the time. Because yeah, the, same the, here. Yeah, that, yeah. The, when, when we went through it, there was the SEAL selection, STT at the time, it was called SEAL tactical training. Then you go proba- proba- on probation with the SEAL team in the SEAL platoon. Yeah. And then the SEAL platoon says, yeah or nay, and if it says yay, then you become SEAL. Yeah. And I know quite a few guys that made all the way through the proba- probation in the, in the platoon, and they were sent back to the fleet. No shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was, uh, there was one guy uh, from our team that that happened to, but... Uh yeah, but that was it. There weren't there weren't a lot of guys, but uh, no, no, not that many. But yeah. uh, you're right. Some. But there was there was yeah. some that yeah. were they yeah. make it all the way through, not to yeah. make it to the uh, what, platoon. Yeah, um, taking one step back was uh, was going to Benning for static line, <laughs> fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> after like our no, no, no. For me, it was a fucking Disneyland. You know, yeah. when I was growing up. Well, had you had you ever static lined? No. Yeah. So I mean, it was like a dope on the rope. Yeah. The, the, so first of all, the, the the preparatory time, right? When they teach you the all these, the, the, you have those towers. You jump out of the tower on this sling, yeah. and then you sling or you ride to this uh, 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 place where you just stop. 
good God, that was like Disneyland for me. I just yeah. wouldn't want to stop. I wanted to go over and over. Yeah. So yeah, that, that thing was that, that was that was great. My problem was that I was scared to do PLS. I couldn't do PLS because I was like, I tried one time. The first time I think it was wind. I fucked myself up. I say fuck this. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So when I was landing that round parachute, I was just standing up. I just land, stand up, and and they yell at me. Say those black hats. Uh, PLF, PLF, private. I was like, Roger, that. So I put him through my parachute. I already was packing my parachute, gathering my parachute. So I throw it back on the ground and just gently roll myself on it <laughs> with, so I don't injure myself. And then, yeah. uh, and then so it was accepted yeah. as my PLF yeah. <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. You were going to say when you were growing up something before uh, uh, when I asked you about going to, to Benning, you said. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Because when I was growing up, it was like, they didn't have a big Disneyland's. There were sometimes little, like the similar, but small Disneyland that just, but we didn't have the money. I never had the chance to go to something like that. Yeah. So for me, chance. it was like, holy shit, this yeah. is like better than Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so that's true. so that, yeah, for Benning, yeah. I, I remember very, well, yeah. uh, very, very fondly because yeah. it was great. Yeah. So, uh, so you're at SEAL Team 2, you're a new guy. Um, what was the first several years there like? Because this obviously is the mid, or, you know, 92, 93. So first platoon, right? So we are still a fucking new guy. Basically, you, you, you are, you're, you're the Duda man. Do this, do that. And um, I remember when you come back from the first platoon, then you can ask for different schools, right? For You can ask for... I want to go to like, let's say, sniper school, the dive supervisor school, whatever. You know, you just ask if teams, uh, teams usually send you there. The, the commander will send you there unless they have some specific need that they need you somewhere else. So like everybody said, well, I'm going to this school, I'm going to that school. What are you going, Drago? Like, well, uh, English 101. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they actually sent me to English school. And I'm, oh, sure. I, I appreciate that because it maybe saved my career. Because my English at the time was still on the level that sometimes I had to translate my uh, what you say to Polish and then react and then backwards. But I was pretty quick with it, so nobody caught on that what was going on. Yeah. But they figured out that English would help me. So when the guys were uh, polishing, I had to be a sniper, you know, yeah. or the dive supervisor. <laughs> I was uh, I was sitting in the class learning English. Yeah. So, well, that was good, you know. Yeah, I mean, was dive physics a challenge in buds? If, not if, really, because the mathematics and the, and physics in Poland were not so uh, uh, were pretty, pretty high level, so I didn't have much uh, problems with it. Um, I think I ran out of time though on the yeah. first uh, on the first uh, time, so I had to repeat that exam. Yeah. and this is where I was introduced to Wheel of Misfortune. Yeah, you yeah. remember that? Oh too, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. Where you we spin the wheel yeah. and, say, and the wheel tells you if you do push ups, sit ups, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's good uh, Good times for sure. Yeah. It's not a bird. It's not a plane. It's the most revolutionary ball trimmer the world has ever seen. Gentlemen, our friends over at Manscaped have been working night and day to bring you the below-the-waist grooming experience like none other with their brand-new Performance Package 5.0 Ultra. Features the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. We're talking about a next-generation trimmer with interchangeable blade heads for whatever shave your mind can imagine. You can go with the flying V, the landing strip, whatever. You can go straight bald if that's your uh, your flavor. Upgrade your grooming game to the Ultra Sphere this year by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with code Mike Drop. That's high tech for low places. Uh, I will say AI is cool, but this might be the be biggest technological advancement the world has seen in the past decade. Anybody with a shorn undercarriage can tell you that. Everybody, every guy knows how... Scary it can get when you're going for the close shave below the belt. That's why I trust Manscaped for all my sensitive areas. In this package, you'll find the star of the show, which is that 5.0 Ultra Lawn Mower. Uh, it's got two interchangeable skin-safe blades, uh, taking a little off the top or with the foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. There's dual LEDs to be able to pay attention to what the hell you're doing. And it also includes the Weed Whacker 2.0, which is an ear and nose trimmer. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant to make you smell good in those areas. The Crop Soother Toner and two free gifts. Uh, it's got the uh, Skin Safe technology, which uh, helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate spots. Seal the deal with Manscaped's liquid formula, the Crop Soother, the Crop Preserver. 
Uh, and Manscaped's even going to throw in two free gifts with their Performance Package 5.0, which is Boxers 2.0 and the Shed 2.0 travel bag. Uh, get 20% off plus free shipping with the code MICDROP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with manscaped.com, code MICDROP. All right, as you guys know, I used to dip when I was in the military, uh, as a lot of us do. Um, the tradition of it and just the ritual, uh, which the enjoyment that comes from that is significant and not one that I uh, particularly like to give up, uh, as I know a lot of my brothers in arms uh, tend to feel the same way, which is why I like Black Buffalo. It's got two product types, which are uh, long cut and pouches. They're made from the same base ingredients, which is edible green leaves, food grade ingredients, and no tobacco leaf or stem. In both of those formats, you can get wintergreen, mint, straight, peach, or blood orange. Um, and it's just a, it's a phenomenal product that, uh, you know, is tobacco free. Uh, they also have nicotine, uh, pharmaceutical grade nicotine versions and nicotine free versions. If you want to ditch the nicotine as well. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I've, I've enjoyed and, and been able to transition off of dip from, uh, and it's something that, um, in terms of honoring that ritual and, and getting that same feeling, uh, of having that ritualistic dip is, uh, is pretty awesome. So Go to blackbuffalo.com uh, for your introductory package and uh, get 20% off with code MICDROP. That's blackbuffalo.com, 20% off, code MICDROP. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Black Buffalo products are intended for adults age 21 and older who are consumers of nicotine or tobacco. All right, so you're going to English. Um, Throughout that entire process, did um, as, as a few years go by, obviously it's peacetime, so the platoons are, are a little different. Uh, but then, you know, Bosnia kicks off. Did yeah. you have any involvement in yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. So my second platoon went to Bosnia, and I, w- I think I'm like extremely, I don't think maybe extremely lucky, but the, this is when I realized that our officers are on a totally different level. I mean, they, they, they do what we do, basically. They get the, the ass kicked like we do, but that to be accepted into the officer corps with the SEAL teams, you still have to uh, demonstrate your leadership, demonstrate the qualities that is not required from from us, maybe to that extent. And um, that's that I was working with uh, Mr. Bill B. Uh, he was my uh, com- my platoon OIC. And uh, I tell you that, uh, that I'm, I'm still impressed with this uh, with this officer. Like with any other that I work with, I mean, this uh, good God. I mean, that's that was a great platoon. That's yeah. what I met. I think one of the strongest team guys in the SEAL teams I ever met. Uh, I can tell his name because I asked him about it, about the permission. Is Chris Stroop. He eventually became a pilot, and today he's a pilot. But this guy, holy shit, he, he uh, in, in that platoon, he created a whole workout to, to make us bigger and stronger for entire platoon. We became the almost entire platoon over 200 pounds. Uh, oh, wow. it, it, so yeah, that was, that was, that was great platoon. Um, Chris actually, uh, he, when we went to France, they didn't like us. The French is the, 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 the commando up there. They didn't like us. So, uh, but they, 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 they didn't like us even more when Chris put like five plates, I think on each side <laughs> and pressed that, that thing in the, that the, the French is bar fucking bent and plates are falling off. So now they got even more pissed off at us that, they, that we fucked their equipment up. But yeah. they didn't like us anyway, so yeah. we just say fuck it. Yeah. They, were, they were like tiny guys. They, they, when we walk into the gym first time, we see like a bunch of dudes in spandex, I think, doing jumping jacks and with like five pounders and stuff. So we're joking that they give them a tutu and it would be like tutu, you know, the, yeah. the you know, what's what the tutu? Tutu? The, yeah. the, the, ba- the ballet yeah. thing, mm-hmm. and the leotards and tutu, and they'll be just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and when, so after Chris bent that bar, they never work with us, uh, work out with us. When we walk into their gym, this entire crew, whoever was there, sit down on the, on, on the, uh, by the wall on their little tiny benches and just stare at us. Yeah. It was just like That's disturbing almost. Yeah. Um, so was that right before you went to Bosnia, or that was a different? Uh, that was when we were in Bosnia because we were making the trip. So we were in Bosnia, rotating to, from Germany to Bosnia with the, our yeah. sister platoon. But in between, when we were on the rest uh, period, we were going to like different trips, different things. Yeah. So we went to France, went to Switzerland. Oh God, 
who just caused the international incident incident in Switzerland. I don't know if you heard about it, but mm. so we we were jumping on uh, Saint Moritz Lake, and so C one thirty was flying. That was pretty cool because flying between two mountains on both sides, and you look and we had like maybe five six seconds free fall before we opened parachutes, but we figure out that instead of waiting for the equipment to catch up with us, we just jump with almost everything. So we had the gun loaded, the guns loaded, we had the fucking uh, magazines loaded full of guns. And and uh, so when we land on the lake, there was normal, there were just regular civilians. There were, there was winter time, so there were like a trails make on the lake out of snow and on the ice, on the lake, people were just walking, you know, making exercises. And here we come with the fucking loaded guns and <laughs> land right in the midst of them. <laughs> Apparently, we were the first troops in Second World War that landed in Switzerland with loaded guns. Oh wow! <laughs> so, it, so somebody spat us out. So there was the um, it came out. Uh, uh, I, I, I think some shit came out out of it. That there was some complaints that yeah. that shouldn't happen. There was kind of like almost, almost international incident. Yeah. Did you guys, when you were in Bosnia, did you guys see any any actual combat operations? Not really. We just at that time there was really not much <coughs> combat up there. So yeah. so no, we, we just uh, uh, like yeah. So but uh, we're on standby like firefighters. Yeah. So between then and September 11th, um, did you were you just at Team Two doing platoons? Yeah, just Team Two doing platoons, <coughs> and uh, our last platoon, I think, it was with uh, Jacko. That's oh, okay. uh, Jacko and Mister uh, Queen F. I don't I, again. I I didn't have a contact with him to ask him for permission to use his name. So I just, I, I will not, that just as a courtesy. But uh, so uh, he was the OIC, Jacko was AOIC, and this is the introduction Jacko to the platoon was, well actually when I met Jacko first time, we were doing the qual swim uh, in the SEAL team too. And the Jacko just showed up. So we were paired up with the like three man pair, I think, and uh, I was the buoy guy. But I look at the Jacko, this guy is a square and and looks so thick and solid, he cannot swim fast. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty good. I can go with the buoy. Fuck. That guy was towing <laughs> me, the other guy, and the buoy. Yeah. <laughs> and we just could not keep up with him. I was actually worried I would over breathe yeah. my my dragger because the, it's just yeah. like the guy was like an animal. He was yeah. a beast. So when we came up, I was like I'm looking at that, just already gained a lot of respect for that guy. Yeah. But then you, then we actually happened that we just end up in the same uh, SEAL platoon. And his introduction was like, okay, you guys, uh, pretty much, I'm, I'll teach you jiu-jitsu. If you don't like jiu-jitsu, you don't know what you are missing. But to make sure that you are not missing anything, I will choke you out uh, right here. So I will choke out the entire SEAL platoon in like 10 minutes. So like, no, I'm fighter, I was fighting. It's like, yeah, right. Well, yeah. within the 10 minutes, we all were choked out, including myself, very easily. Yeah. Where somebody were tapping out, some people were tapping out, some people were passed out. But uh, but maybe like two or three guys who just like suddenly remembered that they had to some do some admin shit, so they, they <laughs> left <laughs> the other door and show oh, up. Oh man, I got this thing. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, real quick. yeah, yeah. So yeah. this was, but you know, so again, new respect for Brazilian jiu jitsu. Yeah. Good God, this is so fucking effective. Uh, it is so effective. I remember so Jaco. I mean, he's fantastic leader. He he took us under his wings, and he was, like when he was teaching us jujitsu, you know, like have some assholes who like fuck you up. Jack never did that. He always make sure that you know we don't get hurt. Yeah. But he was teaching us. I became so effective that I remember I tied up with one of the guys, uh, Scotty. I'm not going to bring his last name, but uh, I, I, I'm in contact with him. So there was Scotty. Scotty, be here. Cheers, brother. So uh, he. Uh, I, I tie him up so bad, and I'm thinking like, fuck, he's not tapping out, M motherfucker, tough guy. And Jacko like, Drago, Drago, let go, let go. You need to go. I say, no, he's not tapping out. He is tapping out. I say, no, he. I, I don't feel any tapping out. They, they basically Jacko like pried me off, Scott. And I say, why, why did you, would you do that? And this guy just cannot say anything yet. But I say like, dude. I thought I would suffocate. <laughs> I, I said, so why don't you tap it out? I couldn't because you tie me up so bad. Yeah. Well, why don't you say tap, tap, tap? Well, I did, but just come out, tip, 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 tip. <laughs> so Jack was like, uh, Jack was like, uh, is looking, like, did, did, did you hear the tip, tip, tip? Yeah. I say, yeah, 
but I didn't know what it means. <laughs> so it was like, dip, 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 dip. <laughs> and he uh, said, basically, he didn't have air, yeah. and I have to say, tap, tap, tap. It was like, dip, yeah. dip, dip. Yeah. Ja- you know, true. Jaco being so, he was very attentive, you know, he makes yeah. sure that we don't ha- get hurt. Yeah. He's seen what happens, that's why he just primed yeah. me off. Yeah. Yeah, I, I awesome. should listen to him right away, and we say, let go, let go, but I was just like, well, he doesn't, he's not tapping out, but yeah. Jaco yeah. seen something that I didn't see it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you, you did a, a platoon and deployment with him? Yes, yes. This is where we hijacked the Russian tanker. Oh, so I'll just say the vessel boarding sergeant seizure, the VBSS operations. We yeah. basically, well, instead of saying hijacked, because this kind of sound bad, I would say we acquired. Uh, we you acquired. can say hijacked. <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> okay. Well, we acquired the Russian tanker. Yeah. So the, the funny thing is, <laughs> yeah, we hijacked that. Yeah. I'm a real pirate. Yeah. So, so the funny thing is, is that, you know, we searched the boat. Uh, uh, you know, we had like, I think, three minutes to 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 to, to acquire the boat, to intercept it because if not, it, it the, there was a Volgonaft. Uh, for 147 Volgonev, that's the name of that ship. He was skirting the territorial waters of uh, other countries, and we had like three minutes to get him away, because if they turn into territorial waters of another country, we have to jump, because otherwise we'll be we'll cause international incident. So, uh, so we were quick. Yeah, we we, we got this when we searched it, because I was on the initial assault. So uh, uh, boarding. So when we came back, the other crew came in and they like did Curtis search again, and they came back pissed off. It's like, dude, you just miss all the weapons and everything, and they just had like bags of bunch of clinking shit, clink clink. And I was like, what did we miss? I said, all these n- n- weapons. So me and Jack are looking inside. Dude, this is like fucking the spoons, forks, and butter knives. Come on, <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, and then Chaco looks at the, the binoculars on the ship. It's like, so you stole their fucking butter knives and yeah. forks and spoons while you love those axes up there hanging on the door. The, the safety axes, we didn't yeah. want to take it. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that was kind of a funny thing. But I speak Russian, right? So uh, I speak uh, Polish, Russian, and Japanese. So... Uh, w- when we came back again after the other crew, you know, took all the knives and forks and spoons away, the the Russians kind of like start being resistant again because they were polite. But then it was like, you motherfuckers, and we need to, we need our forks, we need our spoons and knives. I said, why do you need that? Because we cannot eat. We need to eat. I said, well, use your fucking hands. You know, you eat with your hands. No, this is not the problem. The problem is we don't have a teeth, and they just open up. There was like maybe eight of these guys, and among them all, there was not even one full set of teeth. Wow! But among them, so we like look at them, look at them, and like fuck yeah, <laughs> these poor guys they can't eat. Jesus! So we talked to Jacko, and Jacko said, "Yeah, go, go ahead and call for the forks, knives, and the and the butter knives. Yeah, <laughs> bring them wild. back." So we bring the whole back to them, yeah. giving to yeah. them. No problems with them. They were happy as yeah. they can be, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I get the Polish and, and Russian. Why the fuck do you speak Japanese? Uh, well, I was doing kickboxing and uh, karate, kyokushinkai. This is where I start. So my mom, she was a teacher, and she was working with a Japanese professor. Uh, and uh, um, so I figured out, like, I, don't, I understand some of the Japanese commands, but I would like to know more. And this is how I just started getting private lessons in Japanese oh, from okay. this guy. And I was become so good that even uh, my... Uh, my, uh, uh, I was like guiding the Japanese uh, around the lots, the city. I was guiding like tourists, Japanese tourists speaking Japanese. Oh, okay. Shit, that's cool, man. So, yeah. uh, no, that's wild. Uh, all right, so you do platoon with Jocko. You guys take down the uh, the Russian tanker. Um, f- from then until 9-11, anything big happened that was uh, kind of of note? No, just only we, on that deployment, we left as a SEAL team too. And you remember the Vision Twenty One Hundred, uh, the two thousand Vision Two Thousand, yeah, kind of the, uh, w- went blind. Yeah, uh, we came back as a SEAL Team Four. So as mo- most of the guys on the platoon came back as a SEAL Team Four. It was nice about SEAL teams because, uh, like, even if you have to move, because in the Navy, you know, you have to change command every so often, right? But with us, like, if I was changing command from SEAL Team Two to SEAL Team Four, I'll just grab my bags, my kids. Uh, um, uh, my kid bags and uh, I just rolled that shit into SEAL Team 4 cages and yeah. uh, you know we had the old cages up there so 
just wrote, get the cage in Seal Team 4, and I was yeah. in Seal Team 4, so yeah. I can still live in the same place. That was pretty nice about Seal yeah. Teams. Yeah. Uh, so 9-11 kicks off. Where were you when that happened? I was actually in the gym in the Seal Team 2. We were working out, jacking, jacking up some steel, and then uh, there was a small TV. Somebody comes in and says, hey, guys, some small airplane crashed into the building. And everybody like, yeah, what a fucking idiot, you know, just running, r- crash right into the building. What that idiot was thinking. And then uh, we look at it and say, that doesn't look like a small airplane. And then just came up that there's something weird going on. So we all went to, there was a bigger TV on the quarter deck of Seal Team 2. And I was watching the second plane crashing into the building. So we knew that w- w- we'll deploy. Yeah. Did you get what was the next deployment like for you? <clears throat> uh, my my de- next deployment because uh, the 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 West Coast got involved in the war, so we we were uh, I think next in line. We uh, so we my platoon was sent to South. We were working in South America, mm. and uh, that was already the shit was going on in the Middle East. And then I got Cal like in the middle of my deployment. You know we do six month cycle right, and then it was like. I don't know, like 18 months sometimes, the World Cup. So in the three months of um, my deployment to South America and Central America, I get a call that I will go fly to Baghdad. I will deploy to, to, to Iraq because there is a Polish Special Forces unit operating there with the Navy SEALs with us, and we need somebody to coordinate it to kind of like uh, liaison uh, between them. And I was like, fucking nice, I'm going to Baghdad. <laughs> you know, we are pretty aggressive guys, right? Yeah. So like everybody, what the fuck? Why is Drago going, not me? Yeah. I, everybody wanted to go to war. Like, I don't know any SEAL that didn't want to go to war. Well, maybe in the Eddie Gallagher's case, there was a couple guys that uh, actually, um, I, I really don't have much respect for, for, for what, what they did to yeah. uh, Chief Gallagher. Yeah, no shit. Uh, Eddie Gallagher is for me, but uh, out of the respect, I use Chief yeah. Gallagher. Because that, that guy is a war machine, yeah. is, is awesome operator. So anyway, so uh, everybody was like, hey, Drago is going, what about us? We want to go too, you know? But yeah. it was expected. I, if, if I was left out, I would feel the same way. Yeah. So I was sent to Baghdad, and this is where my uh, war adventure started. So <clears throat> that was supposed to be three months. I was told, you go three months in here, you go for three months, you come back and start a new cycle, your work up with your platoon, it's like you know, nothing happened. So I said, sure. So that uh, I went there for three months. I didn't come back here <laughs> later. <laughs> what, uh, what, what was that in, tw- in 2003? Yeah. So this is, a, so when I went there, uh, uh, Rob O'Neill, my, my, my best friend from the, my previous platoon, we were like best friends. We are still best friends. So Rob O'Neill, uh, I, I just called him on quarter deck, say, hey, tell, tell, t- t- tell the command, because nobody called me. I, didn't, I never heard from my command, a peep. So I'm like, enjoying myself and say, having a great time, but just to be on the safe side. I say, hey, Rob, just tell them that I'm doing fine, that everything is okay. I'm still in Baghdad. I say, okay, Drago, got you, you know? So like three months pass and I don't hear anything. So then I say like, hey, Rob, don't tell anybody I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, yeah, okay, so no problem. Just, yeah. So yeah, so the three months time to the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's like pretty much, uh, uh, year deployment for yeah. me before I came back. <laughs> yeah, that's a trip. We uh, when I was there with SEAL Team Three at the right at the start, and we took down uh, a couple the, of oil the, rigs. The with, platforms, yeah, yeah, with, yeah, yeah, with yeah, the with Chrome, yeah. yeah. So you that's, weren't there. There, I wasn't there yeah. yet. Yeah, okay. I came right after it. Yeah, uh, I, I'm curious. What was your impression of the ground guys when you first met them, and what did they think of you being a a, a, a now Polish American special forces guy. Like what? Uh, or I'm not Polish American. I'm American. No, I know. But I mean yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're saying. So, uh, so they, uh, so they, they were surprised. They, they, they were surprised also even more with my past, because a lot of these guys were also maybe too young to participate in this, the events of solidarity, trade movement, the martial law. But their families, the, 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 the tradition of the, the trade movement, the solidarity opposing communism, were still in, with, with their families and their parents. So for them, I think even more important became that 
I was one of the of their heroes from that side. Yeah. That uh, and even today, when I talk to some of them, these guys like I'm still you know, can can imagine that we met the guy who actually was in prison in Poland and became Navy SEAL eventually. Yeah. So, but the, my impression with them was first that they are big bully guys. They fucking they they can fuck people up. Yeah. And uh, but then when I when we start looking at their training, the, the, how they conduct themselves in combat, I was fucking impressed. I mean yeah. that was I mean you, I'm, you were with them, yeah, you know were, it. They were fucking so, legit. Yeah, 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 very legit. And like when I show up up there, my command said like, "Well, we don't want to let you go with them because we don't know them. We, you know, like command. They won't yeah. protect you. They want you to be safe as much as possible." But. I had none of it. I was like, no, I can't, I can't do that. I mean, I, I wouldn't respect myself, you know, sitting on the back and yeah. talking on the radio. That's not what I trained for. And uh, so they say, okay, well, let's send you go on like two missions with them, see what we think. What do you think? Let us know what you think about it. Yeah. So after two missions like that, I think that all the doubts, everything was gone. These guys are fucking hot yeah. shit. Yeah. So they were doing the same thing we do, maybe often faster than we do because they're like... We all have our, our ROEs, right? And they, they have the same ROEs. Their interpretation may be a little bit more <laughs> different, like helpful to us. So, yeah, a little more so, gray area. Yeah, so we could actually do things that uh, that were uh, mu the much faster yeah. way and much more aggressive way, but yeah. still, you know, within the our ROEs, of course. Yeah. For me, the, the interesting thing were... I guess there was two things. Number one was that I, like they had all the same gear, like even yeah. the same oh, yeah. carbon fiber shepherd hooks for VBSS and the you know weapons like yeah. their kit. I mean, it, it was all like holy shit! Like these guys are rocking the same. Their shit movements too. Did you Everything. Notice, though, like, yeah, I mean, the taking down the targets. Like yeah. I didn't have to train retrain anything. I was just yeah. doing my stuff. It was on the par. It was with them. So their training was on par with ours. Yeah. I, I mean, they, those guys were trained. But there is one more thing that what people don't understand that these guys, uh, I think, were so effective because they never had the bar baggage of the communist style of military because they were built from scratch from the very beginning on the model of us, of the SAS, of the German Special Forces. So the, the good thing for them was that they could actually take the best things from SAS, from us, from Green Berets, and incorporate that unit. So sometimes when we're operating, we're in the middle of Baghdad, and there's like, I get a call on the radio, hey, who is this, our guy, or this is a grown guy? I look in, like, through the night vision, like, fuck I have no idea. Yeah. It's one of us. Let me go check it because, yeah. it, you know, the, the, the same movement, the same postures, the same uh, equipment, the, the uniform in the night vision kind of blurs out so you cannot see they have a little bit different pattern. But you, I couldn't see it through the night vision. But yeah, they were sometimes hard to tell who yeah. is. Who is. And we exchange ourselves too. Yeah. Like when we need more guys on assault element, we just, we had a couple of Grom guys. When Grom needed more guys on assault, uh, usually me and maybe a couple of more, a couple other guys were going yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they were but, funny stories. Yeah. I mean, I remember hearing about you doing that, like when it was happening, it was just like, holy shit, dude, what a, what a fucking time to be alive, you know? But, uh, yeah, for, no for me, the, the other thing was thinking like, man, 20, 25 years ago, we would have been fighting these guys, you know? Yeah. No before, kidding. Yeah. Like in, yeah. in 03, Well, they wouldn't exist in the first place. Right. But just, but, but we would Polish fight military. Polish military like, yeah. yeah. Just like they were enemies. Yeah. It, it was, it was mind blowing at, especially at that time yeah. in the early two thousands of thinking it wasn't that fucking long ago. That, no, it was not that, that, you know, we would have been on opposing yeah. sides, but, uh, the transition was the easier though, because Pauls always admire America. Yeah. And, and they were the, the, the America was enemy to socialist government, communists, uh, communist government, the socialist state, yeah. but only to them. People always admire America. So that when the thing changed, that was totally different. So there's, yeah. there's not like you have a hardened enemies who suddenly yeah. become friends. These guys were actually really always friends. Yeah. The, 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 the government, the communists were not. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you keep in touch with or, or ever contact your dad once you joined the U.S. military? Not until I, when he was already old and I expected to die. So I was asked to come and visit him and uh, kind of man things up. I really didn't want to do it, but, you know, there was, he was on his last leg. So I said, why not? I, I just go up there. So me, uh, my, uh, my wife, 
Rachel, beautiful Rachel, <laughs> uh, went, we went to see him, but I also took the Grom guy with me. I said, dude, you need to bail me out. I fucking don't like this guy. I want nothing to do with him. So, you know, if he tries to, you know, like try to keep as long as I'm, just find some excuse to fucking get me out of there. And uh, so Pavel, uh, Naval, uh, he, the, one of the Grom guys went with us. We meet our father and, uh, and uh, basically that was it. I'll just look at this guy and like, really, I might just just meet the guy on the street and call him a father. Do you know if he, uh, what his thoughts towards you were? If, like, did he have any sense of pride of what you did or was he ashamed? Oh, uh, no, he, he wasn't ashamed. He just didn't know me. So he didn't, I don't think he even knew that I was a SEAL. I, I, I didn't talk to him about it at all. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, That's surprising. I, I think he knew maybe what I was doing, but again, we didn't talk about it. And I, I really didn't have nothing to say to him. We just show up up there and we'll sit down and have a tea. Uh, his wife still was there, you know, and uh, and uh, really. I mean, he, he didn't ask, like, you showing up with a, a Polish Special Forces guy. Show, oh, show. He, he didn't know even there was a oh, really? Special Forces guy. Oh, no he just shows that he, he's a yeah, friend of some, mine. Yeah, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, it seems crazy to me. Like, you, you'd think that he would, like, it didn't come up like, hey, what the fuck you been up to? It, it was no. more surface level. No, really, it was a very strange meeting. It yeah, was just like, you know, you meet two people who have nothing <laughs> in common, who never yeah. met before, and sit down at the table and have a tea and have nothing to talk about. Yeah, wow. Um do you know what happened? Like what happened to him? Obviously, when communism fell and, and everything kind of switched over to oh, like, he, he never changed his mind. He never until the last his last breath. He was an ardent communist. The, the only thing that we talk a little bit about it is about like I mentioned that see what history now says. See the real facts. What happened? What happened in Katyn? That uh, Soviet Union murdered fifteen thousand Polish officers. He said he 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 absolutely denied everything. He wow. just he still believes that uh, people fucked the socialism up. That 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 socialism was a, such a great uh, idea that could be implemented. Seems like he never seen this. Every five years, people being shot on the streets and murdered uh, in protesting that uh, asking for freedom. Seems like that never got to him. Yeah. He always think like yeah, that was such a great idea. But you know what? This is like with the uh, the, the Snow White or a fairy tale. It's a great idea, but if you try to in, you really don't try to implement in the real life. Same thing with the fucking socialism. And there's one more thing. Let me out here about the socialism. I hear all the time people say socialism is good because socialism is all about the government paying for police for for roads for building schools and that socialism is not bad well if this is you this is pretty naive uh, 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 understanding of what socialism uh, ideology and economic system is it's very naive because by that standard we would have to call morocco saudi arabia socialist countries yeah. or pakistan socialist countries because they they pay for the police build the roads and schools so this is, this is such a bullshit this is for naive people who are half educated or those who who really try to justify the, their poor understanding of this dangerous ideologies yeah no i, I agree um do you know i mean was he ousted like going from being a no he, i think no he retired because the transition in poland was very peaceful. I mean, very peaceful, but mostly peaceful. Yeah. They there was no violence. They the only violence was from the socialist side. The violence was still uh, this anti-fascist groups attacking people. But otherwise, it was was very peaceful. Okay. And uh, so they let him just retire yeah. from the. Uh, all right. So back to Iraq. Um, Oh, I had a good time there. <laughs> yeah, so you were there for a year going on raids with uh, with the Grom, and, and, you know, you did multiple deployments with yep. the SEAL teams. If you could, um, you know. So uh, when I came back, uh, so after eventually, I think I would stay there longer because, uh, you know, I wasn't going through divorce at the time, so there was a lot of tra problems in SEAL team. So there's like, hey, no news from Drago is good news. Let just, whatever he is, whatever he's doing, just keep him there, let him do it, and we don't hear from him. He doesn't cause any problems. <laughs> so so eventually, like, I think after nine months, my NVGs broke. So I, like, you know how when SEAL platoon deploys, we have certain limited amount of spare parts, but we this is for the platoon. We cannot just like give it away to anybody uh, there. 
So I had to call my command and I said, hey, you know, I need NVGs. Can you send me NVGs to buy that? And some fucking new guy, FNG, in the armor is like, uh, NVGs, uh, who are you? I said, I'm Drago. Okay, Drago, uh, <laughs> do you, do, 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 where do you want to send those NVGs? I say to Baghdad. Oh, okay, to Baghdad. Do you want a suicidal bomb fest with it too? <laughs> they throw up some fucking Iraqi. I say, dude, do you really think that I'm like an Iraqi insurgent who got suddenly direct line to SEAL Team 4 armory? Are you fucking out of your mind? Yeah. And get me Master Chief online. So Master Chief comes on the line and says, Hey, Drago, you know, how are you doing? I said, hey, Great, Master Chief. Where are you at? I'm in Baghdad. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. How long have you been there? I said, Almost nine months, eight months. Oh, <laughs> hold on a second. Let me get Excel online. So then the, uh, after talking, I said, Hey, you need to come back because another SEAL team, and I cannot just talk the, you know, like the numbers and stuff, but another SEAL team is deploying. Yeah. And you need to come back, integrate with your platoon, do the workup and deploy. So, um, so I came back. Kind of funny story because when I came back, uh, we came back on the weekend. It was winter time. Uh, we, we, I went to the checkpoint. There was a military site of the Norfolk on the military airport. They, the the guy says, "Hey, do you need some help?" I say, "No, just help me unload these, put these boxes on the curb. The truck is coming to pick me up." and and I'll be out of your hair. And there was like three or other guys came in from like no seals, just regular uh, guys, regular military. They, their wives picked them up and uh, they were gone. So <clears throat> so I went up there, I sit down and I'm waiting for the track, I fell asleep. <laughs> Fucking I hear like, woke me up with the buzzing of the, the lamp above the head. <laughs> I said, what the fuck, what am I doing here? I'm freezing, I'm about to go hypo, into hypothermia. So I'm just knocking on the door. I said, I need to get to my phone. Because you know, I was almost a year out of the country and my phone is dead. And uh, my girlfriend already left too because by this time I was, said I was going to divorce. I had to find a girlfriend. But after, I think like, I was supposed to be three months out. So I told her I'll be back in three months. Six months later, she, she, she wrote me a letter that, well, that's not a life for me. That's yeah. like a month I could understand. Three months I could barely stand it, but six months is way too long. So yeah. you go, I'm going to go to a Christmas party to, with somebody else. I say, okay, good, bye. And uh, so when I came back, there's pretty much no place to go. So I'm just sitting there on these bags and like, fuck, I'm cold, I'm freezing. So nobody answered that because there was weekend. There's the, no, no flights anymore uh, coming to that airport on the north, on the military side. So I forget, I need to get to the phone. So I just grabbed this encasement. I'm, like, I'm going to throw it through the fucking window and get in the car with somebody because I will freeze. There's nobody there. So I just, I hear this fucking encasement and, 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 and for the garbage can. And this guy ran up like, through the window and I'm there like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so what do you need? I say, I need the phone. So he let me inside. I called the, uh, that was a weekend. So. The, no, there was nobody on quarter they can seal team four. I called the group too. And these guys like, we don't have anybody here coming in from the, what the fuck? With my accent, I think, I think they didn't help. So finally the OD, because when I say like, motherfucker, just give me OD. It's like, what the, he knows the lingo. So you know, they call OD and I can hear the paper shoveling say, kind of got quiet, say Drago. We are so sorry. We overlooked <laughs> that. We are sending the track right now. Wow. So they sent the track. There was a guy came, like a tech came in. I, I like him. He was a pretty good guy. So we loaded my guns. We got to SEAL Team 4. I just I checked my weapons, everything in, put my stuff shit in the cages. And uh, just, I don't know, on the on the hinge, I, I, I just, because I didn't have a car. My car was with my ex-girlfriend at the time. So I said, I have no key to it or nothing. So I'm going to just snatched the key for one of the pickup trucks parking outside the Team 4. So I took it and then, then we walk out but uh, and this guy jumped the truck. I said, hey, hold on a second. I don't remember the code to the SEAL team. What's the code? Well, dude, uh, there's new regulations now. You SEALs are not allowed to sleep in the in the cages anymore. <laughs> so there is no more. So just come back on Monday. Now I cannot give it to you. And he took off. So I was like, fuck, I cannot even get in the SEAL team because my plan was because I didn't have a place to go, so my plan was just go to the cage. And we did all the time, you know, like, yeah. people like it. So those, there's a lot of seals going through divorce, through all that shit going on. So a lot of us just sleep in the cages. I did have done it too. 
and it's, it's good because you have like go to Platoon Hard, you have a free cable TV, then you have a fucking uh, gym 24 hours for yourself, and you have uh, all the showers and everything there, right? So it's like having a home. So I, won't, I couldn't get to the caves. Like, fuck, what do I do? So <clears throat> it was already late night, but I'm thinking like, I just go, I'm so hungry right now, I need to go to IHOP. So I went to the bank, <laughs> I had like $24, so I couldn't get $24, I could only get 20. I took $20, there's really not much to to, to eat, so um, I cannot buy a lot to eat. So, I, I, but I know IHOP, so I'm going to go to IHOP, I gave me some fucking, uh, those crepes that I like so much. <laughs> they have a, they had the cheese blints. So I'm saying okay, the cheese blints, maybe coffee, and and then I'll just find out, figure out what else do I want to do. My phone is still dead, so I drive to the IHOP up there. It's like late night. They open 24 hours. Thanks God. And um, so I sit down, I eat my cheese blints, have a coffee, and it becomes a warm. You know the smell of the food and everything. So I'm just like fuck. I just go not for a second, just close my eyes for a second. Well, I didn't wake up until this guy was in. So <laughs> he shaved by the shoulder, hey, are you okay? I was like, yeah, okay, I look at this guy, I'm still like fucking trying to focus my eyes. And he just, <clears throat> there's a security guard, it's like a rent cop type of guy, I say, I say, yeah, I know, do you mind if I just stay a bit longer here? Because I'm, I'm just like, I, I, I order more. He say, well, so he looks at me, the bitch kick you out, right? I was like, what the fuck is he talking about? But then it's like, I'm getting my wits back together. It's like, yeah, the bitch kicked me out, you, you, you're right. I say, like, can I stay maybe a little bit longer? Can I, yeah, st- you can stay here, just don't make any problems, don't cause any problems. I say, no, I won't. And I fell asleep, I saw. <laughs> and my first, so I, I slept through the night, wake up, I wake up right in the morning, in the IHOP, and then drove to see all team four, I see some guys already milling around the fucking compound, so I just called them out. And they gave me the code and say, yeah, don't worry, these motherfuckers. And yeah. It's just like, they, they don't want us to sleep here, but we still sleep. Yeah. So then we're just playing cars at night and stuff. They say, hey, Drago, we heard the stories about, they were telling me stories that yeah. they like fucking, even I didn't know some, some of them. So that was, that was pretty good, you know? So yeah. I connect with the guys back and then, but then the other SEAL team was going out and say, hey, you know what, we can, it'll be good to help us at this in, uh, interface with Grom, we never worked with Grom. That was their, their, their first trip in the war zone. And so just can you go for us for like a couple of weeks, maybe for a week? I say, and I say, yeah, hell yeah, I go. And then, so like the couple of weeks time to four months. <laughs> so, so you went right back over. Yeah, I went just right back over. And then uh, CL Team 4 is calling back, hey dude, you need to come back, man. We are, we, we yeah. are next, yeah. we, we, we need to come back. So I came back and just went right back again for, with the CL Team 4. So Jesus. yeah, I spent some time there. That's pretty cool, actually. That's really but cool. But the missions changed, you know. There's, uh, at that time we were babysitting the, the, the Iraqi prime ministers and stuff with the bodyguards. So uh, there was the so-called the no fail missions that, yeah. we, that we we couldn't fail. That, yeah. that, that was not we we must not fail even because you your life. So yeah. so that, that was the time. But I was trying to still get out of it. Yeah. This is where the legend came out. Yeah, Drago was doing his own missions yeah. on his own. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's how that. Uh, yeah, I did get into some. I love the A's. I, 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 you know, we all do. We are aggressive. The babysitting some old man who can hardly walk. You know, and don't even understand what he's saying because we don't speak. Iraq, uh, Arabic, uh, it wasn't really my, my side of the fun, but we did it, you know, it, was, it had to be done, it was done. Yeah. Uh, but any time, any chance I found, uh, I find myself to go on the mission and yeah. do the DA and kick yeah. some ass. What, did, uh, when you were back over there with SEAL Team 4, uh, were you working <laughs> with Grom then also? Was what? Were you working with the Grom when you came yeah. back with SEAL Team 4? Uh, no, working? no, 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 at that time, no. They, they, the Grom moved on to somewhere else. <clears throat> and uh, they were, uh, actually they were already inten- intensifying their operations in Afghanistan. Oh, so okay. so now, that, that time was just working with our guys and uh, the NDAs. What's the craziest raid that you went on with the Grom? I think the craziest one was, uh, there was, I can't remember, two. One of them was, uh, we were kidnapping Iraqi general. Uh, we were acquiring uh, well, kidnapping. Well, uh, body uh, snatching. Yeah, body snatching. Well, I, I would say <laughs> that we're, sounds we're, way better. We, yeah, we, we, we're inviting Iraqi general to yeah. prison. How yeah. about that? That yeah. sounds that's, that sounds like very politically correct. So we're inviting Iraqi general to prison. This guy was a murderer. He was planning the IEDs, organizing and uh, help financing, killing our soldiers. 
So we were hunting that motherfucker for like six months, I think. And we just, he was always one step ahead of us. Finally, we got it. Yeah, he's there. So uh, I'm, I'm the breacher, right? So I'm the, the, that's my expertise. And the, the info came in that there's a f steel gate and heavy doors behind it. So the charge must be, and I look at the picture, seems like, yeah, it is there. So I set my charges up for the calibrated for just for the, for that. We walk into the door, fucking no steel gate. The doors are those picture maybe some somewhere else. The 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 doors look fairly whimsy, just solid wooden door, but just that. So I changed my charges and we set it up, and this is where the whole hell broke loose. The, the shooting started and no, the shooting yeah, and that when I blew the charge, uh, so we bust into the uh, the the thing. Uh, w what I didn't know at the time that uh, that motherfucker was holding to the doorknob and listening, his ear was pretty much where I put the charge. Oh <laughs> shit! So w when I blew it up, you were getting the the dude is all st no, not, there was a specialized charge that I designed later on that we, you know on my first deployment that we were using to minimize the fragments so we can actually get in the target with, ex with explosive without hurting people inside because. I had to do it because they told us, well, if we don't change something, uh, we will be hurting civilians. And you know, the lot on target was, they were always surrounded by civilians mm -hmm. and kids. So I had to change the charge. So I designed the charge that now you can actually blow this thing out without harming people inside, but still stones the people inside. So the dude was holding the door of an ear by the door and I blew it. And fuck him up the, the, enough that he was stunned. He was still standing, holding the door knob in his <laughs> fucking hand. So we throw him on the ground, you know, and just uh, the. Um, so he was holding the door knob, hand the door in the ear. So when I when I blow it, uh, we, you know, we throw him on the ground and handcuffing him. I look and say, "Fuck, three hands." Did I kill somebody there? Or just where, where the fucking third hand came from? I'm looking around, say, hey, look for another body here. Look for somebody else. But then I look closer, I just like fillet his hand and just open it up. So uh, you can see the bones inside and stuff. I say, wow, this is pretty fucking cool, the way it looks like. And, and then I, so I put it right back on. I put the you know, handcuffs on him, I used it as a tourniquet. So I tied it pretty hard so to stop the bleeding, but it didn't bleed much at the time. It's just like, I'm looking like one hand and third hand. I say, what the fucking mutant or what? <laughs> Three hands. Jeez. But yeah, that was just his hand fillet. Yeah. No, no big deal. We, he got a shot of morphine, he, so he shut up, he stopped screaming. And, and then, you know, we hauled his ass to, to prison. But before that, so um, he's laying on the ground, you know, I put the tourniquet, I put the fucking uh, handcuffs on him. And, and the dude like, uh, Polish, 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 Polish forces. And one of the grown guys says, yeah. And the dude in clear Polish, clear Polish language with a correct accent, say, hey guys, get me out of here. Americans are hunting me. If you get me out of here, I have all the resources. I have friends in Warsaw. I'll make you rich. I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything you want. No I shit. I did general sense. So yes, Drago, tell your people that motherfucker we got the son of the bitch. He started crying then. He's like, oh, oh you, how could you do that to me? How could you do that to me? And then, I, I, and I still have it. I have a picture of him standing in the Warsaw with some old Polish generals from the communist times in front of the like Polish landmark in Warsaw, the Palace of Art and Culture uh, built by the Russians in 1950s. Oh, so, sure. so yeah, the guy was actually trained Polish. He was training as a pilot in the, by the Polish uh, Air Force uh, 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 in, in Poland in 19, I think, 70s and became eventually Iraqi general who spoke better Polish than his Iraqis, I think. Holy shit. So Damn, that, that was wild. kind of weird, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and one of them, another was when I had to blow th shit on myself because uh, we, the, you know, we had always intel on the pictures and, uh, you know, Iraqis, usually the Iraqis uh, places where we were uh, uh, assaulting were, um, there was fence, you know, a certain distance from the wall, there was house, the house was fenced off. So I say, well, okay, the doors are inside right here on this side, so I can stack my assault train on this on, on this wall between fa fence and the wall, and uh, I would just go pull the charge, go up there, hide with them. And so I press the charge, and now we're coming back, the train is stuck, but there's no place for me, because what I didn't see it on that picture is the rubble 
and that, that 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 space between their house and the fence was filled with rubble. So now I was thinking like, fuck, now I can climb the fence back, but then all these rookers and stuff, when they wake up, they can start shooting at us. So we are also inside the compound. So I said like, fuck it. Uh, I just got on my knees, I put the, the my carbine, my M4 in front of my face and, and just snuggle up as much <laughs> as I could and blow that shit up. Yeah, it fucked me up a little bit, but you know, like at this time I already knew, I was doing it for so long time that I already have the system that I had the system that so the safe distance I was calculating for by the book, you know, but with, with the regulations, with the but then I was doing another calculation just for me for shit like this that if I if, so I don't blow myself up I know the absolute minimum that I can stand up and be there and not be totally fucked up I can be injured but maybe uh, but not incapacitated yeah so I was there I, I knew I'm within this calculation so I was fine um, but you know this I wrote in my book uh, just m the, m about this it's when I read it it sounds very dramatic but it was not really that dramatic you know there was just a blow the shit up I did stumble and got kicked out of the way the assault train when they move um, when the girl moved they they basically you know I, I just stumble on their way uh, and they just kicked me out of it and uh, just move on. I just catch up on the back of the train. We still clear the house. We got the son of the bitch and, yeah. and we're driving. But uh, again, it's no big deal because we had another assault element stage to to secondary bridge if, if, if needed. Uh, I didn't I didn't deem it. We need that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the cases like this, I'm not the only one. There's quite a few of us actually, breachers that went through it. Uh, I mean, that no, not quite a few, but I know another case when uh, our body actually had to do the same thing because there was yeah. no place for him to hide. So if you know your job, if you know your, if you are expert in it, you can, know, you know how, how far you can push it. And yeah, I was like, oh, that's my expertise. Yeah. Uh, how many deployments did you do uh, with the SEAL teams where you, you weren't working with the ground where you were just, I think seven, seven deployments. Yeah. So with seven, including the war. Yeah. yeah. So seven deployments. Uh, how, how many deployments uh, in Iraq? Uh, three, three back to back um is is there a, a couple of operations raids etc that you could uh talk about that that when you were with just the u.s seal teams um yep so we did uh we did fallujah and uh so we 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 went and uh that was a, that was a really bad guy and uh, i don't speak arabic but you know I invented my uh, the so, so called Drago accelerated English course for terrorists. <laughs> so basically, you give me like five minutes with the terrorists, maybe ten, and I guarantee this guy will speak English. So we did uh, we did a raid on one, one of these guys, and uh, I remember um, uh, I couldn't speak Arabic, but we so what is the weapon? What is the weapon? And uh, and the guy just couldn't say so. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go. And then the, our translator, uh, Johnny Walker, comes in. And he starts asking me the question. The guy doesn't want to answer. So Johnny kind of like you try to use my my technique, uh, but was not very using my technique of the teaching the English, uh, the, uh, convincing the guy to speak, not very effective. So I say I'm, I'm going to help you, Johnny. So uh, let me go use my Dragos accelerated English course on this guy and well but he fell asleep so they said hey guys we need to bail out we have a guy who's moving on us and so and so so we need to we need to move out and there's the same time when um i hurt my back so i couldn't just just grab the guy so i grabbed him by his, i remember he had like a long bird very long so i wrapped my hand around his bird i throw him over my shoulder and <laughs> he just ran with the guy so i remember coming to the humvees just to load the guys like who's that drago with prisoner <laughs> so it's funny, look, his feet are just behind because he was still sleeping yeah. so so yeah so that's uh, we talking that was that was a really bad guy yeah. so we got him that was only with our with our forces <clears throat> and then another thing was with that was with Jacko, but we, we had a grom on it too. So there was the time when they murdered four of our contractors, right? One of them was former Navy SEAL, yeah. uh, Halveston. And um, they, so they, they cleared the Fallujah, like the cordon Fallujah, but nobody was going in. It was like, okay, let's leave them there. 
And we, we so uh, Grom and uh, Jaco Platoon, we, we rolled in. We just like, they opened the gates for us. So we rolled into that hell up there. There was a hotel, a bunch of Syrians, uh, terrorists, uh, full of them. So we just, we just like, it's quiet. It's like nobody there. There's no forces in Fallujah. So we roll into that hotel. And we start blowing the shit up. I mean, blowing the doors because they were all locked up in themselves. So, so uh, uh, my guy apparently had the same thing. He was holding the doorknob and picking to the keyhole. Keyhole, like what's going on up there when I blow the charge? So, so again, I was using those specialized charges, so it didn't fuck him up too much. But uh, then, so we mastered the, those prisoners uh, on the on the like my was on the third floor. I think that it was third floor. So everybody got his own prisoner. So I got mine too. So we start rolling them out and we're just walking down. You know, colors are being passed. We are moving down. My guy doesn't want to go. That motherfucker, every step he falls down. So I would say, I think I need a drag accelerator, an English course or something. So I understand we need to go. And we go on the stairs. He falls down. I fall down. So we just rolled a couple times. And I was like so sweaty, so dirty. I was white from this dust up there because the shit was being blown up, the doors and everything. So the dust is everywhere. So when I came out of this building with my prisoner, I'm like fucking all sweaty, all dirty, white, like fucking like, like a ghost. And it's like, what happened to you, Drago? I say, that motherfucker doesn't want to go, man. He's just resisting. I think he has something on, he knows that he something that, that, that we don't. And I said, what do you mean he doesn't want to go? He just doesn't want to go. He falls down every time. I said, like, like, dude, it's not that he doesn't want to go. He doesn't have a leg. I was like, what? I pick his dress. There's a skirt, you know, whatever they wear, this thing, that skirt. Fuck yeah, the guy has a one leg. So he was not like he was falling down because he didn't want to go. He just couldn't go. I didn't know it. So we were both falling down on the stairs. <laughs> Did he lose the leg then, or he? No, 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 no. He lost the leg. He, he just he just didn't have a leg. Oh, I got you. Yeah, Jesus. yeah. No, he didn't lose the leg. He yeah. just like, uh, yeah. Okay. But it's like it was like I said, why is he falling down? Why he doesn't want to go? He's why is he resisting so much? You know. But yeah, he just couldn't go. Yeah. Did you guys have? Uh, I I got I got him safely to the Humvee. Yeah, yeah you, you you managed to get him there. Yeah. The uh, in in that uh, time frame the, that was the Ramadi. Uh, was that the first? Uh, incursion into there or the second? Uh, the Fallujah, yeah, that was the first, uh, one of the first incursions there because we were doing that more, I think. But again, there was like, the, the, the city was cordoned and there was nobody there. We all pulled out from there. So only we seals were going on in, okay. and uh, snatching these guys. It was pretty heavy combat, right? I mean. Yeah, later on, yeah. Yeah. What, uh, were there any operations or, uh, you know, missions that you went on, direct actions, raids, et cetera, that, that went wrong? Um, not really. We didn't have anything, uh, didn't, didn't, uh, anything wrong except hitting the wrong houses sometimes. Oh, that, yeah. uh, but there was just, you know, being accident or the wrong intel. Yeah. Uh, but uh, not really. We didn't have um nothing that comes to my mind we're so busy or so many of these things that it just it blurs you know just like you remember maybe one or two missions to 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 direct two da's well but uh, but some of them are just like one after another another and it blows up to the point that uh and i don't know if this is maybe of out of tbi already i remember with the grom guy we went to the house and uh, we, we did the raid we got the guy but then uh we, this is how I remembered it, that I get on the chair, I move the uh, picture, and there's a bag with two wires coming out of this bag into the wall. So I'm like, fuck, EOD. Well, that's not what happened. And then, because I had the helmet camera and I look at it, maybe that memory came from that, me watching the helmet camera when there was a Grom guy actually went on the chair, he moved this picture and there's a bag with, we don't know, we throw explosives and wires coming into the wall uh, from that bag. But, but I convinced this guy that was me on the chair, he agreed with me, but then I look at the video with my brother, I think you were right. Wow. That was uh, that was uh, you. I think maybe me watching that video because the camera actually zooms on that yeah. her, his hands, and when he moves this picture hanging on the wall, that bag is up there yeah. hidden. Wow. 
So, uh, so yeah, the memo to play streaks on you too sometimes. Yeah, yeah no <laughs> doubt. Um, as you wrap up your your deployments to Iraq, what was the transition like going from uh, from that to ultimately getting out of the Navy? And what was there kind of a turning point for you where you you were ready to to get out of the out of the military, or what what was your thought process there? Uh, well, it's time. let me go back for my first deployment. At the end of my, for my first deployment, I already noticed that I'm losing memory. Well, I didn't know that first. I just remembered I couldn't make through paragraph even. I was reading paragraph, and by the end of the paragraph, I forgot what I was what the paragraph was about, what it starts with. So sometimes I have to reread three, four, five times to understand. And also reading had a problem. Seems like I couldn't follow the text. My eyes were just not focusing on the text. It was everything was blurred. I thought maybe there was just poor lightning in the tents. You know, we're leaving the tents up there, so uh, maybe maybe this. But and then uh, my balance. So I already knew that things are something is maybe not right. And uh, so that was after the first deployment. So the second deployment, you know, because the breaching, there's there's so many the, the, these explosions going like next to you that you set off, um, and then my, after my third deployment, I knew that, that something is wrong. So my orders were first to the breaching school to be instructor, but I said, like, a, I'm fucked up, I'm, and something is wrong. Uh, and so I call to change my orders somewhere else. Uh, I, I'll say, I go even in combat, but I don't want to go to breaching school when you're exposed to it every single day, like, like for so many times. I just wanted to hit enough of it. So, uh, so they didn't want to change it. I had to call actually behind the back, Chief Berenger. I was in combat with him. So when I told him my problems, he said, yeah, i get you something. So, so he got me orders to BUDS. And uh, that time we didn't know what the TBI is. At least I didn't, and most of my friends, team guys didn't know it. So uh, I noticed in BUDS when I was instructor there that I'm waking up at two o'clock, like, Two o'clock and I'm fucking I'm wake up, wide way wake, wake up, so try to figure out how do you try to figure out? You go to your buddies, right? So I'm just go to the team guys and say, hey, uh, something is wrong here. I'm I'm waking up at two o fucking o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. So they eventually the consensus was that not this is TB maybe TBI that this is a fucking ghost that my apart apartment is in Coronado is haunted. <laughs> So then I realized I'm fucking scared of ghosts. I fucking don't like ghosts. So I started looking for a different apartment. I couldn't find it because there was nothing that cheap. And eventually start, we started getting more and more information about the TBI, about the effects of explosions, multiple explosions on your brain and uh, all that stuff. So that's, that's the time that I realized uh, that, yeah, this is, my time is up. Yeah. So, uh, so no, as I, I did 20 years. But I, uh, I, I, I kind of use, by this time I met Rachel, and uh, and not uh, I was ready to retire. So yeah. you know the, the worst thing is when you are past you miss your mark to retire. Whether you are boxer, whether you you, you are fighter, whatever, uh, you, you, eventually they start working against you. So yeah. I think I came to this point, and I think I recognize that it's time for me to go. Yeah. So yeah, I retired after twenty years. But uh, no, the, at the same time, I, I met Rachel. Oh God, I'm, I met her online. That's really? A, oh yeah, that's what, look. When I came back from war, I didn't have a family. I didn't have anybody. My family was SEAL teams. My SEAL brothers. So for me, I was thinking like, I'm about to retire. I need a family. I need a wife. I need to find a wife, guys. Can you help me out? Hook me up with some chick. So they said, so they're like, oh, you should go on Tinder. <laughs> no, they, yeah, well, kind of. They, they, that's what they say. They say. You need to go on the American Singles website. <laughs> go on the website. You can make some checks up there. So, so I did. And, you know, my English is still not very good, right? But so I, at that time, I couldn't write. I still have sometimes problem with it. So I, I found this chick, and, and I was like, fucking, she's hot, man. I'm just like, can you guys help me? So basically... She was writing to me, I was reading it to them, and they were writing the love letters to her. <laughs> That's so fucked up. <laughs> well, I, I was scared that she might not like me. And actually, I'm glad I did that, because first they told me, I, she's too young. Dude, you need to just cut your, some of your years, years of your age. 
So I say, fuck, okay. How much younger is she? Oh, she's like 15, 14 years younger. Yeah. So, so um, I'm glad I listened to them. So I just cut myself like five years, I think maybe six years. <laughs> and then she, so they told me to do so, that I'm a, you know, fellow team guys. So I did that. And then I'm glad because actually I came like two months of, their cut, of her cut of age. She's like, yeah. so I'm not correspond. I'm not writing with anybody over a certain age. So I just barely, barely made it. And then finally they got tired of writing my love letters too. So they said, hey Drago, you need to go and uh, just, we wrote you like tons of it. So just copy and paste. You can make good letter. You can make any letter you want out of this, what we already wrote you. I say, okay. So I did. And like, fuck, like as soon as I send it, maybe like next day her profile disappears. <laughs> I was like, God damn, I'm the, in this person. I'm running the <laughs> first team guy I met up there. I said, hey dude, I sent her this letter. There's something wrong with it. He just like, oh dude, you fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how can I fix it? I say, well, dude, okay, I'll write, you fuck I'll, it up? Uh, yeah, I'll write you another letter. So he, he said he, he will write me another letter, but her profile was gone. So I'm like, I'm in really like despair. I'm very, very, very sad. And then her profile shows up again. So finally I like beg her, knock her, anything just to call me. So she agreed to call me. She called from like, she switched this thing. So no, no, you don't, re no colors ID. Yeah. So she called me and she, she listened, listened. It's like, oh, so you just don't speak English. Not that you are on drugs or drunk. You don't drink. I say, I'm not drinking. I'm not on drugs. I just do not speak English very well. So we start talking. And what, what happened is when she got my letter, she thought I'm fucking drunk on drugs. So she canceled her account because she already sure had another stalker in the past. She thought wow. maybe I'm just same thing. Yeah. And uh, the only thing we are, the only thing that we are together today is because the American singles, that website felt so sorry for her, for her experience with me, <laughs> that they gave her like 30 more days free. So she came back and yeah, that's why true. I took her to talk then. So then she came back, you know, we just started dating each other. I fell in love. I, 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 when I went to meet her first time, because my bad experience from previous like dates on this American single site. So I said, well, I'll just take a team guy with me. and. He just bails me out. If she is not what she says she is, she doesn't look like the way yeah. she looks on the picture. I'm out. But I bought the I bought in the flowers for her, but I hid them in the jeep. So like, <laughs> if she is like a fake one, I'm not going to do it. So he, I think he recognized her first. He said, "Dude, it's her. She's hot. She's yeah. hot." I said, "Oh yeah, fucking, she's really hot." I say, how did you fucking, did you rob the cattle? How did you fucking do it? She's so much younger. I was like, dude, fucking, you told me to lie about my age and you guys wrote the love letters to her. So what do you expect? And they, yeah. and they uh, so they, uh, and I said, okay, Drago, I'm, I'm out. And yeah. she left. And I remember I woke up to her. I was so fucking scared. I just like stick my hand. It's like, I, I'm, I'm Drago. Yeah. And she's like, I look at me. She like smiles and say, hey, I didn't fly thousands of miles just to shake your hand, give me a hug. So uh, that, that I'm, I'm melted. I was like, fuck yeah, give her a big drag of hug. Yeah. And I did, so then I walked to the car and I was still nervous. So I grabbed the, the, the flowers that I got and just handed to her. <laughs> but I handed her upside down. I was still rubbing the papers. Yeah. It's like, she took it, it's like, oh, wait a minute. So let me, let, let me help you here. Yeah. So she unwrapped it, she flipped it, oh, sorry. She flipped it around, she yeah. put it back in my hand. Said, now give it to me. Yeah. So I say, okay, this is the flat for you. Yeah, what a trip. Where was she <laughs> so, coming from? Uh, from Ohio. This is oh, where okay. I'm living now. So yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah that's that's cool. some wild shit. How did you fuck the letter up? What did you do to... Uh... Well, I just wrote like, like like incoherent because my English, like I'm oh, missing okay. that. And I still make this A. Yeah. And then, you know, just like put one sentence before another one that's supposed to be... It, it looked like, you know... I, still, I might still have it somewhere. You said fuck look, you instead of thank you. No, not that, <laughs> but, but you know, so something, you know, some of the sense could be like, so yeah. fucked up that yeah. she, she got scared. She's I'm another some yeah. weirdo. Yeah. Uh, how long did, uh, so you guys dated and then yeah, obviously we, you moved to Ohio. Yeah, so we dated and um, uh, eventually we got married and uh I, when I moved to, yeah, well, we got married. She had a house. She actually sold her house and she built a new house. Mm. So we just moved into a new house. And uh, and then we started looking for the job. And she, 
She actually, she told me, yeah, I need to start writing resume and stuff. And that's, that's like, you know, when you come out of the teams, like, I was not officer. I was just a sled dog. I was door kicker. So, so my my saving grace was the, my uh, uh, software engineering. So the, the working with programming computers and stuff because I, I loved it. And uh, so she said, "You need to write the resume." I said, "I don't know how." So she helped me write the first resume. I remember the conversation <laughs> today. So she said, okay, tell me about about your job. So what did you do for 20 years? So it's like, well, no, kill bad people. And I was <laughs> like, no, you cannot, nobody will hire you like this. Yeah. So think about something else. And I was like, well, um, like customer service. How about the government customer service? It's like, <laughs> oh, that makes some promise. That sounds good. Expand on it. Well, my customers, my customers were always wrong and I got to kill them. <laughs> no, they cannot be right there. It's going to do that. So finally we came out with something and like within, a, I didn't expect it, but within a month I had a job in the yeah. software engineering company. And you've been doing that ever since? Yeah. 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 Well, can uh, you say uh, who you work for? Or? No, I prefer not okay. today because this is, you know, some of the stuff we talk may be controversial and I don't want my, uh, uh, I don't feel like, um, I don't want to put that company in the corner. So, sure. Uh, can you talk at all about any, any of what you do for them or is that, uh, that would be same thing. That's a the defense yeah. contractor. So I, I gotcha. Okay. Uh, how long have you guys been married? Uh, science, to t oh, I hope she doesn't see it. Uh, <laughs> science 2007. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. So yeah, we have two kids now. We have yeah. a, a little Gracie. Yeah. Uh, she's 14 and a half, and we have a Dorian. She's he's 12, 13, I yeah. think. Yeah, so close. Yeah. Have, uh, your brother and sister are they still in Poland? Yeah, my brother is somewhere here in the United States, and my sister is in uh, Poland. Yeah, so she lives there. As a matter of fact, I've just visited Poland. So, um, actually, the grown guy, uh, one of the like very prolific, uh, he wrote like many books. So he wrote a book about me in Poland. So I went to promote, help promote the yeah. book about me. It's my friend Drago. The <coughs> title of it, "Mój przyjaciel Drago," is in Polish only now. Hopefully, maybe it will be translated one day. Yeah. And um, so the, the, there was a, one of the biggest publishing houses in Poland who published that book, and they did fantastic job. So yeah. there's a there's a like lady who was uh, helping out with the publishing the book, who was actually redacting the book. Her name is Eva, and she's a very uh, awesome, beautiful girl who did so many things to make this book a success. And uh, the book was written by Pavel Naval. And Naval is his uh, uh, former grown guy, oh, who cool. I actually worked very close in uh, in Iraq with. And he came actually to, for that book. He came to visit me um, on the uh, for like a couple of weeks to write that book. Yeah. This is the guy who was telling you was running around. There's like yeah. people were waving to him. Yeah. And he, when he seen the sign, he like freaked out. It's like, I need to take this picture. Yeah. To, 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 to. So we have to, I had to drive him actually to that picture, to that uh, uh, road sign. So he took a picture of the, the road sign yeah. and it's in, my, in that book, in Polish book. That's awesome. Yeah. Are you well known there? Like uh, Not for the seal thing, but more for the solidarity thing. Because oh, wow. now the solidarity thing is... Uh, uh, those people are heroes. They they treated me as a hero, although I'm not. I don't consider myself a hero. But those people like Andrew Krasuski, uh, 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 Edek Kędziorski, Witek Kaszuba, uh, uh, Krzysztof Binkowski, and many many others are, uh, are 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 those guys who are greeting me in Poland, who I met with with every time I go to Poland. I meet with them, and this is the guys we went to prison actually year ago to that prison and we toured the prison because the Poland is free now. They, the prison administration actually made the exception, allow us to tour that prison. And in the prison wall is built a plaque now, the, the, like a more small monument that the prison was holding, uh, harsh, harshest prison Poland was holding uh, uh, political prisoners and it will never happen again in Poland. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. There's a lot of skis in uh, in Poland, right? Most of them, yeah. <laughs> Most yeah. of them. Oh, many of them, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Um, 
So you wrote Pledge to America. Um, yes. A lot of what we talked about is in it, but you obviously there's there's way more. Yes, and this is coming back to my coming to 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 America, the Pledge to America. To I'm I'm I want to be better American citizen than I was yesterday. Yeah. And I will be better American citizen tomorrow than I am today. I, I mean, I love the attitude and in and, uh, and the principles that you adhere to. You know, from really from day one. I mean, obviously the upbringing that you had was, was trying and, and very different than, you know, True. what it would have been here. But, uh, you know, what you've managed to, to accomplish, what you've done with your life is, is nothing short of inspiring. I mean, it's amazing. Well, right. But please remember that it wouldn't be possible if not American people in North America, the free country where you can be whatever you are able to be. There's nothing holding you back. There is no party. There is a communist party. There is no organizations telling you that, you know, if you didn't join communist party, you cannot uh, have this job here. You can be whatever you are able to be, not what you want to be. Because like, if I wanted to be astronaut, I'm too old, right? But <laughs> well, you, you never, know, you maybe I'm, get the age waiver. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. But you know, whatever you are able to be, you are. You, you can yeah. be in America. There is nothing holding yeah. you back. Yeah, I love it. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Pledge to America wise. Well, so uh, maybe not the uh, the book the pl the pledge to America is uh, we we talk about it here, but I would like to talk about Navy Seals Fund. Yeah. A little bit. So this is the organization, this 501c3 charity. It's a little bit different than most of them because we do not have paid positions. We never wanted to have a paid positions and we never will have a paid positions within the organizations as long as I am there. Uh, this is my, you know, I want, I want to pay back to, to, to America, especially to our warriors. So we have uh, also very... Uh, broad charter so we can support uh, people that other charities may not be able to and we often we often do we are very fast to the shortest response time i think with uh, uh, hell being sent i think is one hour where oh, we wow. get, we receive we receive from we receive the call to the 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 uh, the hell was being dispatched to the family so we are very extremely fast and again we don't have a paid positions in it yeah. so everything is done by is is the voting rights on for on the cases are only by the navy seals yeah uh, and uh, we have a civilian oversight we have civilians as a advisory board and our um, uh, uh, our advisors and also our uh, ambassadors that's fantastic i mean I, I love what you're doing is the how, how would you synopsize the the type of support that you give to um, most of it is like but we have, and I'm sure you, I'm sure I'm, I think you might be in that situation. Definitely, I was in the situation that I just lost my job, and uh, suddenly I need, I'm about to lose my house. I'm, I cannot find my job. I have a problem with getting to just if I can get over this hump, just get that maybe catch up with my bills. I, I can just get back on my feet. And it, it happened to me before. So there's a lot of guys like this within our community because for us, sometimes it's not that easy to find a job in the civilian sector. Yeah. So yeah, if we have a case like this, we verify it. And if it is a verified case, we send the dispatch the money. So it's quite often we did make the payment to, uh, to mortgage companies, oh, yeah. to, to, to health centers, to places like this, because like sometimes we get a call, hey, I'm about to lose my, my house. Like, I need to make this payment like within three days. If I don't, I I don't I lose my house. My family will go on the street. Yeah. So we just we just ask for the mortgage company. We just go and make a payment like this. Yeah. But also we are unique because we support not only the Navy SEALs but we support their families. So the yeah. children, the wives. That's of course given right, but the mothers and the siblings. So some of the charities will not support the siblings. Will not. We do. We do. If you and and also we support cases that other charities won't even touch it because well this guy was he was he had a discharge from the navy, uh, not quite the way we expect to have somebody to have. So we're not going to engage in this case. For for us it's different. If you ever hold the fifty three twenty six or being seal officers. We are there for you and we will support you. We don't care how you get out of the Navy, especially now after the war. You know that a lot of these behavioral problems 
within the SEAL teams are because of the constant combat. This war was fought mostly by special forces. So we have the guys who really suffer from TBI, and you can expect them having some behavioral problems. We cannot just dump them and say, well, you didn't retire, honorably retire, so fuck you, I'm not going to help you. We will help you. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I love uh, love everything about it. Um, you know, I think it's both honorable and necessary to, to have an organization like that doing what you guys do. So, Especially uh, nowadays. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Uh, anything else you want to mention or talk about? Uh, uh, one more thing. Yeah. As connecting. So now we know <coughs> there is a lot of censorship going on on social media. And I was heavily censored censored on Facebook. I was heavily censored on the, uh, Twitter when it was a tweet, still Twitter under this twerp, whatever his name was. And uh, and also on LinkedIn, I was my account was shut down twice. I had to recreate. I lost all my followers and stuff. Uh, every time I say something about socialism, and not necessarily like when I describe the socialism in Poland, in Facebook, it cost me always a couple of weeks of suspension or closed account. So that seems like the, the, what surprised me, well, not surprised me anymore. So the terrorists, they have a Facebook account. Yeah. The, 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 our enemies, they have a Facebook account. Ayatollah Khomeini used to have the Facebook account, I believe. But we veterans can't because that's offensive to to, to some of the yeah. elements in our country. So I say, fuck them. I create my own. It is connectzing.com, connectzing.com. Okay. And that's that's where we have no censorship. We don't have a socialist fact checkers. Well, we never had a fact checkers and the, until the the truth started coming out, right? So now they, they, they had to go create the fact checkers. Yeah. We don't have that. We, yeah. you, are, you, you decide what you want to listen to what you want to, uh, what you want to do, awesome. and also I would like to maybe have a second to pray for the guys who didn't come back. Yeah, uh, they can come back from the battlefield or come back uh, from the battlefield, but came back with the war in their heads, and they are no longer with us. Sure. So. Amen. I appreciate uh, taking that moment. That uh, that's powerful for sure. Uh, I do have something for you. Everybody uh, gets uh, gets a parting gift here on the mic drop oh. show. Let me uh, hand it to you here. Uh, oops. Thank you for coming. If you, if you could check it out and show it to oh, the cameras. It, it was honored to be here, oh, brother. It's an honor to have you here. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, if you, if you wouldn't mind checking out the uh, the gift there and showing it to the camera when you get a chance. Yes, <clears throat> On the top, it's a kind of a standard challenge coin with uh, with the mic drop logo on it. Uh, but that's uh, for when you throw your shit kickers on and and rock uh, rock oh, some, wow, some boot. Yeah, so that's a uh, courtesy of Champion Choice Silver and John Johnston in California. So thank you to to them and uh, thanks for coming, thank man. Yeah, thank you. It's honor to be here, yeah. brother. Honor to have you. So uh, this might break the record for the longest show that we've done. Uh, if not, it's damn close. But uh, I'm getting the thumbs up from Zach back there and the camera's blinking, so I think we're about out of memory. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I, can't, I still can't believe you're fucking 62. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's... Uh, it catches up. Yeah, six, 62 years uh, take take some time to, to work through. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you didn't, feel free to choke yourself. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.